open your ears. For which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks? I from the Orient to the drooping West, making the wind my post horse, still unfold the axe commenced on this ball of earth. Upon my tongues continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace, while covet enmity under the smile of safety wounds the world. And who but rumour, who but only I, make fearful musters and prepared defence, whilst the big year, swollen with some other grief, is thought a child by the stern tyrant war? And no such matter. Rumour is a pipe, blown by surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and of so easy and so plain a stop that the blunt monster with uncounted heads a still discordant wavering multitude can play upon it. But what need I thus, my well-known body, to anatomize among my household? Why is rumour here? I run before King Harry's victory, who in a bloody field by Shrewsbury hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of bold rebellion even with the rebels' blood. But what mean I to speak so true at first? My office is to noise about that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword, and that the king, before Douglas's rage, stooped his anointed head as low as death. This have I rumoured through the peasant towns, between that royal field of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hold of ragged stone. Where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick, the posts come tiring on, and not a man of them brings other news than they have learned of me. From rumour's tongues they bring smooth comforts false, worse than true wrongs. Who keeps the gate here, how? When is the earl? What shall I say you are? Tell thou the earl that the Lord Bardolph doth attend him here. His lordship has walked forth into the orchard. Please it, your honour, knock but at the gate, and he himself will answer. Here comes the earl. What news? Lord Bardolph, every minute now I shall be the father of some stratagem. The times are wild. Contention, like a horse, full of high feeding, madly hath broke loose and bears down all before him. Noble Earl, I bring you certain news from Shrewsbury. Good. And God will? As good as heart can wish. The king is almost wounded to the death. And in the fortune of my lord, your son, Prince Harry, slain outright. Uh, and both the blunt skill by the hand of Douglas. Hey. Young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field. <laughs> and Harry Monmouth's brawn, the Hulk Sir John, is prisoner to your son. Oh, oh such a day, so fought, so followed, and so fairly won, came not till now to dignify the time since Caesar's fortunes. How is this derived? Saw you in the field? Came you from Shrewsbury? I spake with one, my lord, that came from thence, a gentleman well-bred and of good name, that freely rendered me these news for true. Here comes my servant, Travers, whom I sent on Tuesday last to listen after news. My lord, I overrode him on the way, and he is furnished with no certainties more than he happily made a tale from me. Now, Travers, what good tidings comes with you? My lord, Sir John Amphreville turned me back with joyful tidings, and being better horsed outrode me. After him came spurring hard, a gentleman almost forspent with speed, that stopped by me to breathe his blooded horse. He asked the way to Chester, and of him I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. He told me that rebellion had bad luck, and that young Harry Purse's spur was cold. With that, he gave his able horse the head, and bending forward, struck his armed heels against the panting sides of his poor jade, up to the rowel head, and starting so he seemed in running to devour the way, staying no longer question. Uh, again... Said he, young Harry Percy's spur was cold. A hot spur, cold spur, that rebellion had met ill luck. My lord, I'll tell you what. If my young lord, your son, have not the day, upon mine honour for a silken point, I'll give my barony. Never talk of it. Why should that gentleman that rode by Travers give then such instances of loss? Who? He? He was some hilding fellow that had stood on the horse he rode on, and upon my life spoke at a venture. Look, here comes more news. Yeah. This man's brow, like to a title leaf, foretells the nature of a tragic volume. 
So looks the strand when on the imperious flood hath left the witness usurbation. Say, Morton, didst thou come from Shrewsbury? I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord, where hateful death put on his ugliest mask to fright our party. How oh, dost my son and brother? Thou uh, tremblest, and the whiteness in thy cheek is apter than thy tongue to tell thy errand. In such a man, so faint, so spiritless, so dull, so dead in look, so woe-begone, drew Priam's curtain in the dead of night, and would have told him half his Troy was burnt. But Priam found the fire ere he his tongue, and I, my Percy's death, ere thou reportst it. This, thou would say, your son did thus and thus, your brother thus, so forth the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds. But in the end, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast the sigh to blow away this praise, ending with brother, son, and all are dead. Douglas is living, and your brother yet. But for my lord, your son. Why, he is dead. See what a ready tongue suspicion hath. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct knowledge from others' eyes that what he feared is chanced. Yet speak more. Hmm. Tell thou when Earl his divination lies, and I will take it as a sweet disgrace and make thee rich for doing me such wrong. You are too great to be by me, Gainsaid. Your spirit is too true, your fears too certain. Yet for all this say not that Percy is dead. I see his strange confession in thine eye. Thou shakes thy head and holds it fear or sin to speak a truth. If he be slain, say so. The tongue offends not that reports his death, and he doth sin that doth belie the dead, not he which says the dead is not alive. Yet the first bringer of unwelcome news hath but a losing office, and his tongue sounds ever after as a sullen bell, remembered tolling a departing friend. I cannot think, my lord, your son is dead. I am sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreathed, to Harry Monmouth, whose swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth, from whence with life he never more sprung up. Aye. In few, his death, whose spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in his camp, being bruited once, took fire and heat away from the best tempered courage in his troops, for from his mettle was his party steeled, which, once in him abated, all the rest turned on themselves like dull and heavy lead. And as the thing that's heavy in itself upon enforcement flies with greatest speed, so did our men, heavy in Hotspur's loss, lend to this weight such lightness with their fear, that arrows fled not swifter toward their aim than did our soldiers, aiming at their safety, fly from the field. Then was that noble Worcester too soon ta'en prisoner. And that furious Scot, the bloody Douglas, whose well-labouring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king, gan veil his stomach and did grace the shame of those that turned their backs, and in his flight, stumbling in fear, was took. The sum of all is that the king hath won, and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord, under the conduct of young Lancaster and Westmoreland. This is the news at full. All this I shall have time enough to mourn. In poison there is physic. And these news, having been well, they would have made me sick. Being sick, having in some measure made me well. And as the wretch, whose fever weakens joints like strength of hinges, buckle under life, impatient of his fit, breaks like a fire out of his keeper's arms, e'en so my limbs, weakened with grief, being now enraged with grief, are thrice themselves. Hence, therefore, thou nice crutch, a scaly gauntlet now with joints of steel must glove this hand. And hence, thou sickly coif, thou art a guard too wanton for the head which princes, fleshed with conquest, aim to hit. Now bind my brows with iron, and approach the ragged stour that time and spite there bring to frown upon the enraged Northumberland. Let heaven kiss earth. Now let not nature's hand keep the wild flood confined. Let order die. And let this world no longer be a stage to feed contention in a lingering act. But let one spirit of the firstborn Cain reign in all bosoms, that each heart being set on bloody courses, 
Rude scene they end, and darkness be the barrier of the dead. This strained passion doth you wrong, my lord. Sweet earl, divorce not wisdom from your honour. The lives of all your loving complices lean on your health, the which if you give o'er to stormy passion must perforce decay. Ye cast the event of war, my noble lord, and sum the account of chance, before ye said, let us make head. It was your pre-surmise that in the dole of blows your son might drop. You knew he walked o'er perils on an edge, more likely to fall in than to get o'er. You were advised his flesh was capable of wounds and scars, and that his forward spirit would lift him where most trade of danger ranged. Yet did you say, go forth, and none of this, though strongly apprehended, could restrain the stiff-born action. What hath then befallen, or what hath this bold enterprise brought forth? More than that being which was like to be. We all that are engaged to this loss knew that we ventured on such dangerous seas that if we wrought out life, twas ten to one. And yet we ventured, for the game proposed choked the respect of likely peril feared. And since we are all set, venture again. Come, we will all put forth body and goods. Tis more than time. And my most noble lord, I hear for certain and dare speak the truth. The gentle Archbishop of York is up with well-appointed powers. He is a man who with a double surety binds his followers. My lord, your son, had only but the corpse, but shadows and the shows of men to fight. For that same word, rebellion, did divide the action of their bodies from their souls, and they did fight with queasiness, constrained, as men drink potions, that their weapons only seemed on our side. But for their spirits and souls, this word rebellion, it had froze them up as fish are in a pond. But now the bishop turns insurrection to religion, suppose sincere and holy in his thoughts. He's followed both with body and with mind, and doth enlarge his rising with the blood of fair King Richard, scraped from pomfret stones, derives from heaven his quarrel and his course, tells them he doth bestride a bleeding land, gasping for life under great bowling brook, and more and less do flock to follow him. I knew of this before. If you speak truth, this present grief has wiped it from my mind. Go in with me, and counsel every man the aptest way for safety and revenge. Get posts and letters, and make friends with speed. Never so few, and never yet more need. <laughs> Sirrah, you giant, what says the doctor to my water? He said, sir, the water itself was a good, healthy water. But for the party that owed it, he might have more diseases than he knew for. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. Men of all sorts take a pride to dirt at me. The brain of this foolish, compounded clay man is not able to invent anything that intends to laughter more than I invent or is invented on me. I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men. I do here walk before thee like a sow that hath overwhelmed all her litter but one. If the prince put thee into my service for any other reason than to set me off, why, then I have no judgment. Thou horse and mandrake, thou art fitter to be worn in my cap than to wait at my heels. I was never manned with an agate till now. But I will inset you neither in gold nor silver, but in vile apparel, and send you back again to your master for a jewel. The juvenile, the prince, your master, whose chin is not yet fledged. I will sooner have a beard grow in the palm of my hand than he should get one off his cheek, and yet he will not stick to say his face is a face royal. God may finish it when he will, tis not a harem as yet. He may keep it still at a face royal, for a barber shall never earn sixpence out of it. And yet he'll be crowing as if he'd written man ever since his father was a bachelor. He may keep his own grace, but he's almost out of mine, I can assure him. <sighs> what said Master Dumbledon about the satin for my short cloak and my slops? Uh, he said, sir, you should procure him better assurance than Bardolph. He would not take his band and yours. He liked not the security. Let him be damned like that glutton. Pray God his tongue be hotter, a horse and a kitterfell, a rascally yea forsooth knave, to bear a gentleman in hand and then stand upon security. The horse and smooth pates do now wear nothing but high shoes and bunches of keys at their girdles, and if a man is through with them in honest taking up, then they must stand upon security. I'd as lief they would put a rat's pain in my mouth as offer to stop it with security. 
I look, they should have sent me two and twenty yards of satin, as I am a true knight, and he sends me security. Well, he may sleep in security, for he hath the horn of abundance, and the likeness of his wife shines through it, and yet cannot he see, though he have his own lanthorn to light him. <sighs> Where's Bardolph? Uh, he's gone into Smithfield to buy your worship a horse. Ha! I bought him in Paul's, and he'll buy me a horse in Smithfield. And I could get me but a wife in the stews, I were manned, horsed, and wife. Sir, here comes the nobleman that committed the prince for striking him about Bardolph. Wait close, I will not see him. What's he that goes there? Oh, Staff, I'm your sure lordship. He that was in question for the robbery? Eh, hey, my lord, but he hath since done good service at Shrewsbury, and as I hear... Is now going with some charge to the Lord John of Lancaster. What? To York? Call him back again. Sir John Falstaff. Boy, tell him I'm deaf. You must speak louder. My master is deaf. I'm sure he is to the hearing of anything good. Go pluck him by the elbow. I must speak with him. Sir John. What? A young knave and begging? Is there not wars? Is there not employment? Doth not the king lack subjects? Do not the rebels need soldiers? Though it be a shame to be on any side but one, it is worse shame to beg than to be on the worst side, were it worse than the name of rebellion can tell how to make it. You mistake me, sir. Why, sir, did I say you were an honest man? Setting my knighthood and my soldiership aside, I'd lied in my throat if I'd said so. I pray you, sir, then set your knighthood and your soldiership aside, and give me leave to tell you, you lie in your throat if you say I am any other than an honest man. <laughs> I give thee leave to tell me so. I lay aside that which grows to me. If thou gets any leave of me, hang me. If thou takes leave, thou had better be hanged. You hunt counter. Hence. Avant! Sir, my lord would speak with you. Sir John Falstaff, a word with you. My good lord. God give your lordship good time of day. I'm glad to see your lordship abroad. I heard say your lordship was sick. I hope your lordship goes abroad by advice. Your lordship, though not clean past your youth, have yet some smack of age in you, some relish of the saltness of time in you, and I most humbly beseech your lordship to have a reverent care of your health. Sir John, I sent for you before your expedition to Shrewsbury. And please, your lordship, I hear his majesty is returned with some discomfort from Wales. I talk not of his majesty. You would not come when I sent for you. And I hear, moreover, his highness has fallen into this same wholesome apoplexy. Well, God, mend him. I pray you, let me speak with you. This apoplexy, as I take it, is a kind of lethargy, and please, your lordship, a kind of sleeping in the blood, a wholesome and tingling. What tell you me of it? Be it, it as it is. It hath it original from much grief. From study and perturbation of the brain, I've read the cause of his effects in Galen. It is a kind of deafness. I think you are fallen into the disease, for you hear not what I say. Very well, my lord, very well. Rather, and please you, it is the disease of not listening, the malady of not marking that I am troubled with all. To punish you by the heels would amend the attention of your ears, and I care not if I do become your physician. I am as poor as Job, my lord, but not so patient. Your lordship may minister the potion of imprisonment to me in respect of poverty, but how I should be your patient to follow your prescriptions. Oh, the wise may make some dram of a scruple, or indeed a scruple itself. I sent for you when there were matters against you for your life to come speak with me. As I was then advised by my learned counsel in the laws of this land service, I did not come. Well, the truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. He that buckles himself in my belt cannot live in less. Your means are very slender, and your waist is grace. I would it were otherwise. I would my means were greater and my waist slenderer. You have misled the youthful prince. The young prince hath misled me. I am the fellow with the great belly, and he my dog. Well, I am loath to gall a new healed wound. Your day's service at Shrewsbury hath a little gilded over your night's exploit on Gad's Hill. You may thank the unquiet time for your quiet or posting that action. My lord. But since all is well, keep it so. Wake not a sleeping wolf. To wake a wolf is as bad as smell a fox. Huh. What? You are as a 
candle. The better part burnt out. A wassail candle, my lord, all tallow. If I did say of wax, my growth would approve the truth. There is not a white hair in your face, but should have his effect of gravity. His effect of gravy, gravy, gravy. You follow the young prince up and down like his ill angel. Not so, my lord. Your ill angel is light. But I hope he that looks upon me will take me without weighing. And yet in some respects I grant I cannot go. I cannot tell. Virtue is of so little regard in these costermongers times that true valour is turned bare heard. Pregnancy is made a tapster and hath his quick wit wasted in giving reckonings. All the other gifts are pertinent to man as the malice of this age shapes them are not worth a gooseberry. You that are old consider not the capacities of us that are young. <laughs> You do measure the heat of our livers with the bitterness of your galls, and we that are i of our youth, I must confess, are wags too. Do you set down your name in the scroll of youth that are written down old with all the characters of age? Have you not a moist eye, a dry hand, a yellow cheek, a white beard, a decreasing leg, an increasing belly? Is not your voice broken, your wind short, your chin double, your wit single? and every part about you blasted with antiquity, and will you yet call yourself young? Fie, 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 Sir John. My lord, I was born about three of the clock in the afternoon, with a white head and something around belly. For my voice I have lost it with hallooing and singing of anthems. To approve my youth further I will not. The truth is, I am only old in judgment and understanding. And he that will caper with me for a thousand marks, let him lend me the money and have at him. For the box on the ear that the prince gave you, he gave it like a rude prince, and you took it like a sensible lord. I have checked him for it, and the young lion repents. Marry, not in ashes and sackcloth, but in new silk and old sack. Well, God send the prince a better companion. God send the companion a better prince. I cannot rid my hands of him. Well, the king hath severed you and Prince Harry. I hear you're going with Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. Yea, I thank your pretty sweet wit for it. But look you, pray all you that kiss my Lady Peace at home that our armies join not in a hot day. For by the Lord I take but two shirts out with me, and I mean not to sweat extraordinarily. If it be a hot day and I brandish anything but a bottle, I would I might never spit white again. There is not a dangerous action can peep out his head, but I'm thrust upon it. Well, I cannot last ever, but it was all way yet the trick of our English nation, if they have a good thing to make it too common. If ye will need say I am an old man, you should give me rest. I would to God my name were not so terrible to the enemy as it is. I were better to be eaten to death with a rust than to be scoured to nothing with perpetual motion. Well, be honest. Be honest, and God bless your expedition. Will your lordship lend me a thousand pound to furnish me forth? Not a penny. Not a penny! You are too impatient to bear crosses. Fare you well. Commend me to my cousin Westmoreland. If I do, fillip me with a three-man beetle. A man can no more separate age and covetousness than I can part young limbs in lechery. But the gout galls the one, and the pox pinches the other, and so both the degrees prevent my curses. Boy! Sir? What money is in my purse? Seven gross and tuppence. Oh. I can get no remedy against this consumption of the purse. Borrowing only lingers and lingers it out, but the disease is incurable. Mm. Go, bear this letter to my lord of Lancaster, this to the prince... This to the Earl of Westmoreland, and uh, this to old Mistress Ursula, whom I've weakly sworn to marry since I perceived the first white hair of my chin. About it. You know where to find me. <gasps> pox of this gout. Or the gout of this pox. For the one or the other plays the rogue with my great toe. It is no matter, I do halt. I have the wars for my colour, and my pension shall seem the more reasonable. A good wit will make use of anything. I will turn diseases to commodity. Thus have you heard our cause and known our means. 
and my most noble friends, I pray you all, speak plainly your opinions of our hopes. And first, Lord Marshal, what say you to it? I well allow the occasion of our arms, but gladly would be better satisfied how in our means we should advance ourselves to look with forehead bold and big enough upon the power and puissance of the king. Our present musters grow upon the file to five and twenty thousand men of choice, and our supplies live largely in the hope of great Northumberland, whose bosom burns with an incensed fire of injuries. The question then, Lord Hastings, standeth thus, whether our present five and twenty thousand may hold up head without Northumberland. With him we may. Nay, marry, there's the point. But if without him we be thought too feeble, my judgment is we should not step too far for we had his assistance by the hand. For in a theme so bloody-faced as this, conjecture, expectation, and surmise, of aids in certain should not be admitted. Tis very true, Lord Bardolph. For indeed it was young Hotspur's case at Shrewsbury. It was, my lord, who lined himself with hope, eating the air on promise of supply, flattering himself in project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts, and so, with great imagination, proper the madman, led his powers to death, and winking leaped into destruction. But by your leave it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. Yes, if this present quality of war, or indeed the instant action, a cause on foot, lives so in hope, as in an early spring we see the appearing buds, which to prove fruit hope gives not so much warrant as despair that frosts will bite them. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot, then draw the model, and when we see the figure of the house, then must we rate the cost of the erection, which if we find out ways ability, what do we then but draw anew the model in fewer offices, or at least desist to build at all, much more in this great work which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up, should we survey the plot of situation and the model, consent upon a sure foundation, question surveyors know our own estate, how able such a work to undergo, to weigh against his opposite, or else we fortify in paper and in figures, using the names of men instead of men, like one that draws the model of a house beyond his power to build it, who half through gives o'er and leaves his part created cost, a naked subject to the weeping clouds and waste for churlish winter's tyranny. Grant that our hopes, yet likely of fair birth, should be stillborn, and that we now possess the utmost man of expectation. I think we are a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. What is the king but five and twenty thousand? To us no more, nay, not so much, Lord Bardolph, for his divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three heads. One power against the French, and one against Glendower, perforce a third must take up us. So is the unfirm king in three divided, and his coffers sound with hollow poverty and emptiness. That he should draw his several strengths together and come against us in full puissance need not be dreaded. If he should do so, he leaves his back unarmed, the French and Welsh baying him at the heels. Never fear that. Who is it like to lead his forces hither? The Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland against the Welsh himself and Harry Monmouth. But who is substituted against the French, I have no certain notice. Let us on and publish the occasion of our arms. The Commonwealth is sick of their own choice. Their over-greedy love hath surfeited. An habitation giddy and unsure hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. O oh, thou fond many! With what loud applause didst thou beat heaven with blessing Bolingbroke before he was what thou wouldst have him be? And being now trimmed in thine own desires, thou beastly feeder, art so full of him that thou provokest thyself to cast him up. So, so, thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard. And now thou wouldst eat thy dead vomit up, and howl'st to find it. What trust is in these times? They that when Richard lived would have him die are now become enamoured on his grave. Thou that threwst dust upon his goodly head when through proud London he came sighing on after the admired heels of Bolingbroke, criest now, O earth, yield us that king again, and take thou this. O thoughts of men accursed, past and to come seems best, Things present, worst. Shall we go draw our numbers and set on? We are time's subjects, and time bids be gone. <laughs> Ma 
master fan. Have you entered the action? It is entered. Where's your yeoman? It's to lusty yeoman. Will I stand to it? Sirrah, where's Snare? Oh, Lord, I, good master Snare. Here, here. Snare, we must arrest Sir John Falstaff. Yea, good master Snare. I've entered him and all. My chance cost some of us our lives, for he will stab. Alas, the day. Take heed of him. He stabbed me in mine own house. And that most beastly. In good faith. He cares not what mischief he does if his weapon be out. If for him like any devil, he'll spare neither man, woman, nor child. If I can close with him, I care not for his thrust. No, nor I neither. I'll bet you'll help her. And I've a fist him once and a come but within my vice. I am undone by his going. I warrant you, he's an infinity thing upon my score. Good Master Fang, hold him sure. Yeah. Good Master Snare, let him not scape. Yeah. I comes continually to Pie Corner, saving your manhoods, to buy a saddle. And he's indicted to dinner to the Lubber's Head in Lambert Street, to Master Smooth the Silkman. Oh, I pray you, since my exion is entered and my case so openly known to the world, let him be brought into his answer. A hundred mark is a long one for a poor lone woman to bear. And I've borne and borne and borne, and have been fubbed off and Pubbed off and pubbed off from this day to that day that it is a shame to be thought of. There's no honesty in such dealing unless a woman should be made an ass and a beast about every name's wrong. You, 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 yonder he comes and that arrant mons he knows nave bore off with him. Do your officers, do your officers, Master Fanger, Master Snare. Do me, do me, do me your officers. How now? Whose mare's dead? <laughs> What's the matter? Sir John, I'll arrest you at the suit of mistress quickly. Oh, Away, violet straw, bard out! Get in the chair! Get in the chair! Get in the chair! Throw me in the chair! I'll throw thee in the chair! Will thou? Will thou? Will thou? thou bastard and rogue! Murder! Murder! Oh, thou honest suck of villain! Will thou kill God's officers and the kings? Ah, oh, thou honest little rogue! Thou art honey seed, a man queller, and a woman queller! Keep them off, Bardo! A rescue, a rescue! Good people, bring a rescue or two! Thou, 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 what, 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 do, do thou, rogue! Do thou, hemp seed! Away, you scallion, you rampallion, you fustilarian! I'll tickle your catastrophe! <laughs> What is the matter? Keep the peace here. Oh, 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 good my lord. Be good to me, I beseech you. Stand to me. How now, Sir John? What are you brawling here? Doth this become your place, your time and business? You should have been well on your way to York. Stand from him, fellow. Wherefore hangst upon him? Oh, my most worshipful lord. And please, your grace, I am a poor widow of Eastcheap, and he's arrested at my suit. For what sum? It is more than for some, my lord. It's for all, all I have. He hath eaten me out of ass and home. He hath put all my substance into that fat belly of his. But I'll have some of it out again, or I'll ride thee a knights like the mare. I think I was like to ride the mare if I have any vantage of ground to get up. How comes this, Sir John? Try what man of good temper would endure this tempest of exclamation. Are you not ashamed to enforce a poor widow to so rough a course to come by her own? What is the gross sum that I owe thee? Marry, if thou wert an honest man, thyself and the money too. Thou didst swear to me upon a parcel gilt goblet sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by a sea-cold fire upon Wednesday and Wheaton week, when the prince broke thy head for liking his father to a singing man of Windsor, thou didst swear to me then, as I was washing thy wound, to marry me and make me my lady thy wife. Canst thou deny it? Did not good wife Keach, the butcher's wife, come in then and call me gossip quickly, coming in to borrow a mess of vinegar, telling us she had a good dish of prawns, whereby thou didst desire to eat some, whereby I told thee they were ill for a green wound, and didst thou not, when she was gone downstairs, desire me to be no more so familiarity with such poor people, saying that ere long they shall call me madam? And didst thou not kiss me, and bid me fetch thee thirty shillings? I put thee now to thy book oath, deny it if thou canst. 
my lord. This is a poor mad soul, and she says up and down the town that her eldest son is like you. Oh! I... She hath been in good case, and the truth is, poverty hath distracted her. But for these foolish officers, I beseech you I may have redress against them. Sir John, Sir John, I am well acquainted with your manner of wrenching the true cause the false way. It is not a confident brow, nor the throng of words that come with such more than impudent sauciness from you can thrust me from a level consideration. You have, as it appears to me, practiced upon the easy-yielding spirit of this woman and made her serve your uses both in purse and in person. Yea, a truth, my lord. Pray thee, please. Pay her the debt you owe her and unpay the villainy you have done with her. The one you may do with sterling money, and the other with current repentance. My lord, I will not undergo this sneep without reply. You call honourable boldness impudent sauciness. If a man will make curtsy and say nothing, he is virtuous. No, my lord, my humble duty remembered, I will not be your suitor. I say to you, I do desire deliverance from these officers, being upon hasty employment in the king's affairs. You speak as having power to do wrong, but answer in the effect of your reputation and satisfy the poor woman. <sighs> Come hither, hostess. Now, Master Girl, what news? The king, my lord, and Harry, prince of Wales, are near at hand. The rest the paper tells. As I am a gentleman. Faith, you said so before. As I am a gentleman, come no more words of it. Try this ebony ground I tread on. I must be faint to pull both my plate and the tapestry of my dining chambers. Glasses, glasses is the only drinking. And for thy walls, a pretty slight drollery, or the story of the prodigal, or the German hunting and waterwork, is worth a thousand of these bed hangings and these fly-bitten tapestries. Let it be ten pound, if thou canst. Come, and oh. not for thy humours, there's not a better wench in England. No. Go wash thy face and draw the action. Come, thou must not be in this humour with me. Dost not know me? Oh, come, come, I know thou wast set on to this. Pray thee, Sir John, let it be but twenty nobles. In faith, I'm loath to pull my plate, so God save me, love. Uh, let it alone. I'll make other shift. You'll be a fool still. Well, you shall have it, though I pawn me gown. I hope you'll come to supper. You'll pay me all together. Oh, will I live? Yeah, go with her, with her. Hook on, hook on. Uh, will you have Doltaire sheep meet you at supper? No more words. Uh, let's have her. I've heard better news. What's the news, my lord? Where lay the king last night? At Basingstoke, my lord. I hope my lord all's well. What is the news, my lord? Come all his forces back. No. 1,500 foot, 500 horse, are marched up to my lord of Lancaster against Northumberland and the archbishop. Come to the king back from Wales, my noble lord. You shall have letters on me presently. Come, go along with me, good Master Gower. My lord! What's the matter? Master Gower, shall I entreat you with me to dinner? I must wait upon my good lord here. I thank you, good Sir John. Sir John, you loiter here too long, being you are to take soldiers up in counties as you go. Will you sup with me, Master Gower? What um, foolish master taught you these manners, Sir John? Master Gower, um, if they become me not, he was a fool that taught them me. This is the right fencing grace, my lord. Tap for tap, and so part fair. Now the Lord lighten thee. Thou art a great fool! Oh, God, I am exceeding weary. It's come to that. I thought weariness does not have attached one of so high blood. Faith, it does me, though it discolours the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. <sighs> Doth it not show vilely in me to desire small beer? Why, a prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a composition. Oh, belike, then, my appetite was not princely got. 
For by my truth I do now remember the poor creature's small beer. <laughs> but indeed these humble considerations make me out of love with my greatness. What a disgrace is it to me to remember thy name, or to know thy face to-morrow, or to take note how many pair of silk stockings thou hast, viz. these, and those that were thy peach-coloured ones, or to bear the inventory of thy shirts, as one for superfluity and another for use. But that the tennis-court keeper knows better than I, for it is a low ebb of linen with thee when thou keepest not racket there, as thou hast not done a great while, because the rest of thy low countries have made a ship to eat up thy holland. And God knows whether those that bawl out the ruins of thy linen shall inherit his kingdom. But the midwives say the children are not in the fault, whereupon the world increases, and kindreds are mightily strengthened. How ill it follows after you have laboured so hard, you should talk so idly. Tell me, how many good young princes would do so, their fathers being so sick as yours at this time is? Shall I tell thee one thing, Poins? Yes, Faith, and let it be an excellent good thing. It shall serve among wits of no higher breeding than thine. I'll go to. I stand the push of your one thing that you will tell. <laughs> Mary, I tell thee it is not meet that I should be sad now my father is sick. Albeit I could tell to thee, as to one it pleases me, for fault of a better, to call my friend, I could be sad, and sad indeed, too. Very hardly upon such a subject. By this hand thou thinkest me as far in the devil's book as thou in Falstaff for obduracy and persistency. <laughs> Let the end try the man. But I tell thee my heart bleeds inwardly that my father is so sick. And keeping such vile company as thou art, hath in reason taken from me all ostentation of sorrow. The reason? What wouldst thou think of me, if I should weep? I would think thee a most princely hypocrite. It would be every man's thought, and thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. Never a man's thought in the world keeps the roadway better than mm. thine. Every man would think me an hypocrite indeed. And what excites your most worshipful thought to think so? Why, because you have been so lewd and so much in a graft of full star. And to thee. By this light I am well spoke on, I can hear it with mine own ears. The worst that they can say of me is that I am a second brother, and that I am a proper fellow of my hands, and those two things I confess I cannot help. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Bardo. And the boy that I gave full stop. I had him from me Christian. And look of the fat villain I've not transformed him, eh? <laughs> God save your grace. And yours, most noble Bardo. Come, you virtuous ass, you bashful fool. Must you be blushing? Wherefore blushing now? What a maidenly man at arms are you become? It's such a matter to get a popple pot's maidenhead. Yeah. <laughs> it comes me here now, my lord, from a red lattice. And I could discern no part of his face from the window. <laughs> At last I spied his eyes, and methought he had made two holes in the alewife's new petticoat, and so peeped through. Hey, that's not the boy profit. <laughs> Away, you horse and upright rabbit. Away. Away, you rascally Althea's dream. Away. <laughs> Instruct us, boy. What dream, boy? Oh, uh, marry, my lord. Althea dreamed she was delivered of a firebrand, and therefore I call him her dream. <laughs> the crown's worth of good interpretation. There it is, boy. Oh, oh. This good blossom could be kept from cankers. Well, there's sixpence to preserve him. And you do not make him hanged among you. The gallows shall have wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and how doth thy master, Bardolph? <laughs> well, my lord, he heard of your graces coming to town. There's a letter for you. Delivered with good respect, and how doth the martial mass your master? Oh, bodily health, sir. Marry, the immortal part needs a physician, but that moves him not, though that be sick, it dies. <laughs> I do allow this wen to be as familiar with me as my dog, and he holds his place, for look you how he writes. John Falstaff, knight. Every man must know that, as oft as he has occasion to name himself, even like those that are kin to the king, for they never prick their finger, but they say, there's some of the king's blood spilt. How comes that, says he, that takes upon him not to conceive? The answer is as ready as a borrower's cap. I am the king's poor cub, sir. <laughs> Nay, they will be kin to us, or they will fetch it from Japheth. Uh, but to the letter. Uh. Sir John Falstaff, knight, to the son of the king, nearest his father, Harry, Prince of Wales, greeting. Why, this is a certificate. Take a piece. 
I will imitate the honourable Romans in brevity. I sure means brevity in breath, short-winded. I commend me to thee, I commend thee, and I leave thee. Be not too familiar with poins, for he misuses thy favour so much that he swears thou art to marry his sister Nell. <laughs> Repent at idle times as thou mayest, and so farewell. Thine by yea and no, which is as much as to say as thou usest him, Jack Falstaff with my familiars, John with my brothers and sisters, and Sir John with all Europe. My lord, I'll steep this letter in sack and make him eat it. That's to make him eat twenty of his words. But do you use me thus, Ned? Must I marry your sister? God send the wench no worse fortune, but I never said so. Well, thus we play the fools with the time, and the spirits of the wise sit in the clouds and mock us. Is your master here in London? Uh, yea, my lord. Where so uh, he? Uh, Doth the old boar feed in the old frank? <laughs> At the old place, my lord. These cheap. What company? Uh, Ephesians, uh, my lord, uh, of the old church. Sup any oh. women with him? None, my lord, but old Mistress Quickly and Mistress Doltershe. What <laughs> pagan may that be? Oh, a proper gentlewoman, sir, and a kinswoman of my master's. Even such kin as the parish heifers are to the town bull. <laughs> yeah. Shall we steal upon them, Ned, at supper? I am your shadow, my lord, I'll follow you. Sirrah, you boy, and Bardolph, mm. no words to your master that I am yet come to town. There's for your silence. <laughs> I have no tongue, sir. <laughs> and for mine, sir, I will govern it. Fare you well. Go! <laughs> this dull tear sheet should be some rogue. I warrant you, as common as the way between St Albans and London. <laughs> How might we see Falstaff bestow himself tonight in his true colours, and not ourselves be seen? Put on two leathern jerkins and aprons, and wait upon him at his table as drawers. <laughs> From a god to a bull, a heavy dissension. It was Jove's case. From a prince to apprentice. Hello, transformation. That shall be mine, for in everything the purpose must weigh with the folly. Follow me, Ned. <laughs> wife and gentle daughter give even way unto my rough affairs put not you on the busy to the times and be like them to percy troublesome i have given over i will speak no more do what you will your wisdom be your guide alas sweet wife my honour is at pawn and but my going the thing can redeem it oh yet for god's sake go not to these wars the time was father that you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now when your own Percy, when my heart's dear Harry, through many a north would look to see his father bring up his powers. But he did long in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two honours lost, yours and your son's. For yours, the God of heaven brighten it. For his, it stuck upon him as the sun in the grey vault of heaven, and by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. He had no legs that practised not his gait, and speaking thick, which nature made his blemish, became the accents of the valiant. For those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him, so that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of delight, in military rules, humours of blood, he was the mark and glass, copy and book that fashioned others. And him, oh wondrous him, oh miracle of men, him did you leave, second to none unseconded by you to look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage to abide a field where nothing but the sound of hotspurs named it seemed defensible so you left him never oh never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honour more precise and nice with others than with him let them alone the marshal and the archbishop are strong 
that my sweet Harry had but half their numbers, today might I, hanging on Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. Most truly your heart, fair daughter, you do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting ancient oversights. But I must go and meet with danger there, or it will seek me in another place and find me worse provided. Oh, fly to Scotland, till that the nobles and the armoured commons have of their puissance made a little taste. If they get ground and vantage of the king, then join you with them like a rib of steel to make strength stronger. But for all our loves, first let them try themselves. So did your son. He was so suffered. So came I a widow, and never shall have length of life enough to rain upon remembrance with mine eyes, that it may grow and sprout as high as heaven for recordation to my noble husband. Come, come, go in with me. As with my mind, as with the tide swelled up into his height, that makes us still stand running neither way. Then would I go to meet the archbishop. Many thousand reasons hold me back. I will resolve for Scotland. There am I, till time and vantage crave my company. <laughs> what? what the devil hast thou brought there? Apple John's? Thou knowest Sir John cannot endure an apple, John. No, oh, mess, thou sayest true. The prince once set a dish of apple johns before him and told them there were five more Sir Johns, and putting off his hat, said, I will now take my leave of these six dry, round, old, withered knights. <laughs> it angered him to the heart, yeah, but he hath forgot that. Well, why then, cover and set them down, and see if thou canst find out Sneak's noise. Mistress Tearsheet would fain hear some music. Dispatch, the room where they supped is too hot. They'll come in straight. Sirrah, here will be the prince and Master Poins anon, and they will put on two of our jerkins and aprons, and Sir John must not know of it. <laughs> Bardolph hath brought word. <laughs> By the mass, here will be old Hutus. <laughs> it will be an excellent stratagem. Yeah, I'll see if I can find that sneak. It's a sweetheart. Me thinks now you're in an excellent good temporality. Your pulsage beats as extraordinarily as art would desire, and your colour, I mm. warrant you, is as red as any rose in good truth, mm. <laughs> Oh, but if they, you've drunk too much canaries, and that's a marvellous searching wine, and it perfumes the blood, ere one can say, what's this? Mm. How do you know? Better than I was. <laughs> <coughs> oh, why, that's well said. A good art's worth gold. <laughs> now, here comes a job. Men of the first in court entered the Jordan, and was a worthy king, how now, Mistress Dawes? Sick of a calm, yea, good faith. So is all her sect. And they be once in a calm, they are sick. A pox, damn you, you muddy rascal. Is that all a comfort you give me? Oh, you make fat rascals, Mistress Doll. I make them. Gluttony and diseases make them. I make them not. If the cook helped to make the gluttony, you helped to make the diseases, Doll. <laughs> we catch of you, Doll, we catch of you. Grant that, my poor virtue, grant that. Yea, joy, our chains and our jewels. Your brooches, pearls, and ouches. Ugh. For to serve bravely is to come halting off, you know. To come off the breach with his pike bent bravely, and to surgery, bravely. To venture upon the charged chambers, bravely. Hang yourself, you muddy conger, hang yourself. <laughs> My troth, this is the old fashion. You two never meet, but you fall to some discord. <sighs> you are both in good truth as rheumatic as two dry toasts. You cannot one bear with another's confirmities. What a good year. One must bear, and that must be you. <sighs> you are the weaker vessels, they say. The emptier vessel. Can a weak, empty vessel bear such a huge fool hog's head? There's a whole merchant's venture of Bordeaux stuff in him. You have not seen a hulk better stuffed in the hold. Oh, come, I'll be friends with thee, Jack. <laughs>
Now what, going to the walls, mm. and whether I shall ever see thee again or no, there is nobody there. Sir, ancient pistols below, and would speak with you. Hang him, swaggering rascal! Let him not come hither. It is the foul-mouthed rogue in England. If he swagger, let him not come here. No, by my faith, I must live among my neighbours. I'm no swaggerers. I'm in good name and fame with the very best. Shut the door. There comes those swaggerers here. I've not lived all this while to have swagger in now. Shut the door, I pay you. Does thou hear, hostess? Pray pacify yourself, Sir John. There comes no swaggerers here. Does thou hear? It is mine ancient. Tilly fellow, Sir John, there tell me. Your ancient swaggerer comes not in my doors. I was before Master Tizick, the deputy, the other day, and as he said to me, twas no longer ago than Wednesday last, in good faith, neighbour, quickly, says he, Master Dunn, our minister, was by then. Neighbour, quickly, says he, receive those that are civil. For, said he, you are in an ill name. Now, I said so, I can tell where upon. For, says he, you are an honest woman, and well thought of. Therefore, take heed what guests you receive. Receive, says he, no swaggering companions. There comes none here. Oh, you bless you to hear what he said. No, I'm no swaggerer. He's no swaggerer, hostess. A tame cheater, if faith. You may stroke him as gently as a puppy greyhound. He'll not swagger with a barbary hen if her feathers turn back in any show of resistance. Call him up, drawer. Sir. Cheater call you in? Oh, I'll bar no honest man, my house, nor no cheater. But I do not love swaggering. By my throat, I am the worst when one says swagger. Feel, masters, how I shake. Look you, I warrant you. So you do, hostess. Do I? Yea, very truth do I. A twin an aspen leaf. I cannot abide swaggerers. <laughs> God save you, Sir John. Welcome, ancient pistol. <laughs> yeah, pistol, I charge you with a cup of sack. Oh. Do you discharge upon mine hostess? <laughs> I will discharge upon her, Sir John, with two bullets. Oh, she is <laughs> pistol proof, sir. You shall hardly offend her. Come, I'll drink no proofs nor no bullets. I'll drink no more than will do me good, and no man's pleasure I. Then to you, Mrs. Dorothy, I will charge you. Charge me? Yes. I scorn you, scurvy companion. <laughs> what? You poor, base, rascally, cheating, lack, linen mate. Away, you mouldy rogue, away! I am meat to your master. <laughs> I know you, Mrs. Dorothy. Away, you cut purse, rascal! You filthy bung! Away! Uh, by this wine, I'll thrust my knife in your multi chaps and you play the saucy cut with me. Yeah. Away, you bottle ale rascal! Yeah. You basket hilt stale juggler, you! Since <laughs> when I pray you, sir, God's light with two points on your shoulder, match! God, let me not live, but I will murder you roughness! No more, Pistol. I would not have you go off here. But Discharge yourself of our company, Pistol. No good, Captain Pistol, not here, sweet Captain. Captain? Mm. Thou abominable damned cheater. Art thou not ashamed to be called Captain? Oh. And captains were in my mind. They would truncheon you out for taking their names upon you before you have earned them. Uh, Go, a uh, Captain, you slave. For what? Why? For tearing I... a bull hall's rough in the baldy house. He, a uh, Captain, hang him, rogue. Oh. Villains will make the word as odious as the word occupy, which was an excellent good word before it was ill sorted. Therefore, captains had need look to it. Pray thee, go down, good ancient. Hark thee hither, Mistress Doll. No, I, I tell thee what, Corporal Bardolf. I can tear her. I'll be revenged of her. Oh, pray thee, go down. I'll never see her damn. First, to Pluto's damned lake, by this hand, to the infernal deep with Erebus and Torture's vile also. Hold, who can lines here? I down, down, dogs, down, Peters, have we not finally Captain Pistol, be quiet. Tis very late, faith. I beseech you now, aggravate your collar. 
These be good humours indeed. So, pack horses and hollow, pampered jays of Asia, which cannot go but thirty mile a day, compare with Caesars and with cannibals and Trojan Greeks. Nay, rather damn them with King Celebus and let the welkin roar. Shall we fall foul for Tories? But my troth, Captain, these are very bitter words. Be gone, good ancient. This will grow to a broad. Men like dogs give crowns like pins. Have we not hired you? There's none such here. What the good year do you think I'll deny her? For God's sake, be quiet. Mm. Uh, then feed and be fat, my fair Calipolis. Come, give us some sack. Si fortune me tormente, sperato me contento. Here we broadsides, no, let the fiend give fire. Give me some sack, and sweetheart, lie thou there. <laughs> <laughs> Come we eat a full points here, and I accept as nothing. <laughs> Pistol, I would be quiet. Mm, sweet night, I kiss thy knee. What we have seen for seven stars. For God's sake, thrust him downstairs. I cannot endure such a fusty and rough. Thrust him downstairs? No, we not Galloway nags? Coit him down, Bardo. Like a shove grout chilly. What? Nay, and I do nothing but speak nothing. There shall be nothing here. How did you don't stand? But shall we have incision? Shall we improve? Oh, oh, oh. Death brought me asleep a bridge by doleful day. By then, let grievous ghastly gaping wounds untwine the sister's tree. Come, at the pass, I say. Here's a goodly ah, spectacle. Give me my rapier, boy. Oh, Get you downstairs! I swear keep me out before I'll be these chillies and brides! So murder I want to know! Alas, alas! Put up your naked weapons! Put up your naked weapons! Oh, I'm crazy, Jack! Be quiet! The rascal's gone! Oh, you horse little valiant villain, you! Are you not hurt in the groin? Methought I made a shrew thrust at your belly. <coughs> oh. uh, we'll turn him out of doors. Yea, sir. The rascal's drunk. You have hurt him, sir, in the shoulder. <laughs> the rascal to brave me. Oh, you sweet little rogue, you. Oh, alas, poor ape, how thou sweatest. Mm -hmm. Come, let me wipe thy face. Come on, you horse and chops. Oh, rogue, face, I love. Thee. Thou art as valorous as Hector of Troy, <laughs> worth five of Agamemnon, and ten times better than the nine worthies. Oh, villain. <laughs> Rascally slave. I will toss the rogue in a blank. Do, and thou darest for thy heart, and thou dost. I'll canvas thee between a pair of sheaves. Oh. <laughs> uh, the music is come, sir. Oh, well, well then let them play. Play, sirs. Sit on my knee, dog. Oh. A rascal bragging slave, the rogue fled from me like quicksilver. If I, then thou followedst him like a church. Thou also, little tidy bastard of you, Oh. When wilt thou leave, fight in the days and point in the nights, and begin to patch up thine old body for heaven? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Stand closer. Uh, peace, good doll. Mm. Do not speak like a death's head. Do not bid me remember mine end. Um, <clears throat> uh, Sarah, mm -hmm. what humours mm. the prince of? Oh, yeah, good, shallow young fellow. 
I would have been a good panther. <laughs> I would have chipped bread well. <laughs> they say Poins has a good wit. He a good wit. <laughs> Hang him, baboon. <laughs> His wit's as thick as a um, Tewkesbury mustard. <laughs> no more conceit in him than is in a mallet. What? Prince, laughing so then? Because their legs are both of a bigness, oh. and are plays it quite swell, <laughs> and eats conger and fennel, and drinks <laughs> off candles ends from flat dragons, <laughs> and rides the wild mare with the boys, <laughs> and jumps upon join stools, <laughs> and swears with a good grace, <laughs> and wears his boots. Very smooth, mm. like unto the sign of the leg, <laughs> and breeds no bait with telling of discreet stories, and such other gamble faculties it has that show a weak mind and an able body. Uh, oh. For the which the prince admits him, <laughs> for the prince himself is such another. The weight of a hair will turn the scales between the avoir du poids. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Would not this knave of a wheel have his ears cut off? Let's beat him before his horn. Look whether the withered elder hath not his pole clawed like a parrot. <laughs> Is it not strange that the desire should so many years outlive performance? Kiss me, darling. Saturn and Venus this year in conjunction. What says the almanac to that? And look whether the fiery tribe on his man be not lisping to his master's old tables, his notebook, his council keeper. Thou dost give me flattering buffets. Oh, I kiss thee with the most constant heart. Uh, <laughs> I'm old. I am old. I love thee better than I love e'er a scurvy young boy of them all. Oh, what stuff wilt thou have a kirtle of? Oh. I shall receive money a Thursday. Shall have a cap tomorrow. <laughs> a merry song come, it grows late. We'll to bed. Oh. Thou'lt forget me when I'm gone. By my throat. Thou set me a weeping, and thou sayest so. Prove that ever I dress myself handsome till thy return. Well, hearken an end. <laughs> Some sack, Francis. Hang on, hang on, Son of the kings, and art not thou points, brother? Why, thou globe of <laughs> sinful continents, what a life dost thou lead? Uh, better than thou, I am a gentleman, thou art a drawer. Very true, sir, and I come to draw you out by the ears. <laughs> the Lord preserve thy good grace, by my troth, welcome to London. Now the Lord bless that sweet face of thine. Oh, jeez, you, are you come from Wales? Thou horse and mad compound of majesty. <laughs> By this light flesh and corrupt blood, thou art welcome. Now, you fat fool, I scorn you. My lord, he will drive you out of your revenge and turn all to a merriment if you take not the heat. You horse and candle, mine you. <laughs> How vilely did you speak of me even now before this honest, virtuous, civil gentlewoman? God's blessing of your good heart, and so she is by my throne. Didst thou hear me? Yea, and you knew me as you did when you ran away by Gaz Hill. <laughs> you knew I was at your back and spoke it on purpose no, to try my patience. No, 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 not so. I did not think thou wast within hearing. I shall drive you then to confess the willful abuse, and then I know how to handle you. No abuse, Hal, on oh, my honour, no oh, abuse. Oh, no. What? <laughs> to dispraise me and call me pantler and bread chipper, and I know not what. No abuse, Hal. No abuse. No abuse, Ned, in the world, honest Ned, none. I dispraised him before the wicked that the wicked might not fall in love with him. Oh. In which doing I have done the part of a careful friend and a true subject. And thy father is to give me thanks for it. No abuse, Hal, none, Ned, none. No faith, boys, none. See now whether pure fear and entire cowardice doth not make thee wrong this virtuous gentlewoman to close with us. Now, is she of the wicked? Is thine hostess here of the wicked? Oh, or is thy boy of the wicked? Or honest Bardolph, oh, whose zeal burns in his nose, of the wicked? Oh. Well, answer that dead elm, answer! The fiend hath pricked down Bardolph, irrecoverable, <laughs> and his oh. face is Lucifer's privy kitchen, <laughs> where he doth nothing but roast malt work. <laughs> For the boy, there is a good angel about him, 
but the devil blinds him too. For the women? Mm, well, for one of them. She is in hell already and oh. burns poor souls. Oh. For the oh. other, I owe her money, and whether she be damned for that, I know not. No, I warrant you. No, I think thou art not. I think thou art quit for that. Mary, there is another indictment upon thee for suffering flesh to be eaten in thy house contrary to the law, for the which I think thou wilt hold. <laughs> All vittlers do so. What's a joint of mutton or two in a whole length? You, gentlewoman. Oh, what's that, your grace? His grace says that which his flesh rebels against. Who knocks so loud at door? Look to the door there, Francis. Peto, how now? What news? The king, your father, is at Westminster, and there are twenty weak and weary posts come from the north. And as I came along, I met and overtook a dozen captains, bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns, and asking everyone for Sir John Falstaff. By heaven, Poins, I feel me much to blame, so idly to profane the precious time. When tempest of commotion like the south, born with black vapour, doth begin to melt and drop upon our bare, unarmed heads. Give me my sword and cloak. Go full stop. Good night. Now comes in the sweetest morsel of the night, and we must hence and leave it unpicked. More knocking at the door. How now? What's the matter? You must away to court, sir, presently. A dozen captains stay at door for you. Oh. Pay the musicians, sirrah. <laughs> Farewell, hostess. Oh. Farewell, doll. You oh. see, my good wenches, how men of merit are sought after. <laughs> the undeserved may sleep when the man of action is called for. <laughs> Farewell, a good wenches. If I not be sent away post, I will see you again ere I go. Farewell, farewell. Well, fare thee well. I've known thee these twenty-nine years come peace cut time, but an honest and true-hearted man, oh, well, fare thee well. Mistress Dashi! What's the matter? Bid Mistress Dashi come to my master. Oh, one doll, one, one good doll, come. She comes, blubbered. Will you come, doll? Oh. <coughs> Go call the earls of Surrey and of Warwick. But ere they come, bid them all read these letters and well consider of them. Make good speed. My liege. How many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? Oh, sleep. Oh, gentle sleep. Nature's soft nurse, how have I frighted thee that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness? Why, rather, sleep, liest thou in smoky cribs, upon uneasy pallets stretching thee, and hushed with buzzing night-flies to thy slumber, than in the perfumed chambers of the great, under the canopies of costly state, and lulled with sound of sweetest melody? Oh, thou dull god, why liest thou with the vile in loathsome beds, and leavest the kingly couch a watch-case or a common larum bell Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mast seal up the ship-boy's eyes, and rock his brains in cradle of the rude imperious surge, and in the visitation of the winds who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafening clamour in the slippery clouds that with the hurly death itself awakes? Canst thou, O oh, partial sleep, 
give thy repose to the wet sea sun in an hour so rude. And in the calmest and most stillest night, with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king. Then, happy low, lie down. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Many good morrows to your majesty. Is it good morrow, lords? Tis one o'clock and past. Why, then, good morrow to you all, my lords. Have you read over the letters that I sent you? We have, my liege. Then you perceive the body of our kingdom, how foul it is, what rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it. It is but as a body yet distempered, which to his former strength may be restored with good advice and little medicine. My lord Northumberland will soon be cooled. Oh, God, that one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times make mountains level and the continent, weary of solid firmness, melt itself into the sea. And other times to see the beachy girdle of the ocean too wide for Neptune's hips, how chances mock and changes fill the cup of alteration with divers liquors. Oh, if this was seen, the happiest youth, Viewing his progress through, what perils past, what crosses to ensue, would shut the book and sit him down and die. Tis not ten years gone, since Richard and Northumberland, great friends, did feast together, and in two years after were they at wars. It is but eight years since this Percy was the man nearest my soul, who, like a brother, toiled in my affairs and laid his love and life under my foot. Yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard, gave him defiance. But which of you was by you, Cousin Neville, as I may remember, mm. when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, then checked and rated by Northumberland, did speak these words, now proved a prophecy? Northumberland, thou ladder, by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne. Though then, God knows, I had no such intent, but that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. The time shall come, thus did he follow it, the time will come that foul sin, gathering head, shall break into corruption. So went on, foretelling this same time's condition and the division of our amity. There is a history in all men's lives. Figuring the nature of the times deceased, the which observed, a man may prophesy with a near aim of the main chance of things as yet not come to life, which in their seeds and weak beginnings lie in treasure such things become the hatch and brood of time. And by the necessary form of this, King Richard might create a perfect guess that great Northumberland, then false to him, would of that seed grow to a greater falseness, which should not find a ground to root upon unless on you. Are these things then necessities? Then let us meet them like necessities, and that same word even now cries out on us. They say the bishop and Northumberland are fifty thousand strong. It cannot be, my lord. Rumour doth double, like the voice and echo the numbers of the feared. Please it your grace to go to bed. Upon my soul, my lord, the powers that you already have sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. To comfort you the more, I have received a certain instance that Glendower is dead. Oh. Your majesty hath been this fortnight ill, and these unseasoned hours perforce must add unto your sickness. I will take your counsel. And were these inward wars once out of hand, we would, dear lords, unto the holy land. Come on, come on, come on, sir. Give me your hand, sir. Give me your hand, sir. Uh, an early stirler by the road. And how doth my good cousin silence? Good morrow, good cousin Shallow. And how doth my cousin, your bedfellow, yeah. and your fairest daughter and mine, my goddaughter, Ellen? Oh, alas, a black oozel, cousin Shallow. By ye, no, sir. 
I dare say my cousin William has become a good scholar. Uh, hmm? He is at Oxford still, is he not? Indeed, sir, to my cost. I must then to the inns of court shortly. If I was once of Clement's Inn, well, I think they will talk of mad shallow yet. <laughs> you were called lusty shallow then, Colonel. By the mass, I was called anything. <laughs> and I would have done anything indeed, too, and roundly, too. <laughs> there was I, and little John Doit of Staffordshire, and black George Barnes, and Francis Pickbone, <laughs> and Will Squeal, a Cotswold man. You had not four such swinge bucklers in all the inns of court again. <laughs> <laughs> and I may say to you, we knew where the boner rubers were, uh, <laughs> and had the best of them all at command. <laughs> oh, then was Jack Falstaff, now Sir John, a boy, and page to Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. This Sir John cousin that comes hither and on about soldiers? The same Sir John, the very same. Oh. I see him break Scogan's head at the court gate when there was a crack not thus high. And the very same day did I fight with one Samson Stockfish, a fruiter, behind Gray's Inn. <coughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, jeez, you, jeez, you, the mad days that I have spent. <laughs> and to see how many of my old acquaintance are dead. Oh, we shall all follow, cousin. Certain, to certain. Very sure, very sure. Death, as the psalmist saith, is certain to all. All shall die. Mm. Uh, how a good yoke of bullocks at Stamford Fair. By my troth, I was not there. Death is certain. Is a double of your town living yet? Dead, sir. Oh, jeez you, jeez you, dead. He drew a good bow and dead. A shot of fine shoot. John of Gaunt loved him well and betted much money on his head. Dead. Mm. He would have clapped you the clout at twelve score and carried you a forehand shaft of fourteen and a fourteen and a half that it would have done a man's heart good to see. Oh. How a score of ewes now. Oh, thereafter as they be. A score of good ewes may be worth uh, ten pounds. And is old double dead? Uh, here come to us John Falstaff's men, as I think. Good morrow, honest gentleman. I beseech you, which is Justice Shallow? I am Robert Shallow, sir, a poor esquire of this county. I'm one of the king's justices of the peace. What is your good pleasure with me? My captain, sir, commends him to you. My captain, Sir John Falstaff, oh. a tall gentleman by heaven and a most gallant leader. He greets me well, sir. I knew him a good backswordman. <laughs> now, how doth the good knight? Uh, may I ask how my lady, his wife, doth? Sir, pardon. A soldier is better accommodated. Than with a wife. <laughs> oh, it is well said in face, sir. And it well said indeed, too. Better accommodated. It is good. Yea, indeed, is it. Good phrases are surely and ever were very commendable. <laughs> accommodated. It comes of accommodo. Ah. Very good. A good phrase. Uh, pardon me, sir. Hmm? I have heard the word. Phrase? call you it. Mm -hmm. By this good day I know not the phrase, but I will maintain the word with my sword to be a soldier-like word. Mm. And a word of exceeding good command by heaven. Oh. <laughs> accommodated. <laughs> that is when a man is, as they say, accommodated. <laughs> or when a man is, being whereby I may be thought to be <laughs> accommodated. <laughs> Which is an excellent thing. <laughs> mm. It is very just. <laughs> Look, here comes good Sir John. Give me your good hand. Give me your worship's good hand. Oh, by my troth, you like well and bear your years very well. Welcome, good Sir John. I'm glad to see you well, good Master Robert Shallow. 
Master Sewer Card, as I think. No, Sir John, it is my cousin Silence in commission with me. Good Master Silence, it well befits you should be of the peace. <laughs> oh, <laughs> your good worship is welcome. Fie, this is hot weather, gentlemen. Have you provided me here half a dozen sufficient men? Nay, have we, sir. Will you sit? Let me see them, I beseech you. Where's the roll? Where's the roll? Where's the roll? Let me see, let me see, let me see. So, 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 so. so. Gabe, marry, sir. Ralph Moldy. Let them appear as I call. Let them do so. Let them do so. Uh, let me see. Where is Moldy? Here, Aunt Please. Oh, what think you, Sir John? A good limbed fellow, young, strong, and of good friends. Is thy name Moldy? Yea. And please you. Tis the more time thou wert used. <laughs> oh, most excellent <laughs> faith. Things that are mouldy lack use. Very singular good. In faith, well said, Sir John. Very well said. Prick him. I was pricked well enough before, and you could have let me alone. My old dame will be undone now for one to do her husbandry and her drudgery. You need not to have pricked me. There are other men fitted to go out than I. Oh, go to peace, Mouldy. Well, you shall go. Mouldy, it's time you were spent. Spent? Oh, peace, fellow, peace. Stand aside. Know you where you are. Oh, for the other, Sir John, let me see. Simon Shadow. Yea, Mary, let me have him to sit under. He's like to be a cold soldier. Uh, where's Shadow? Here, yes, sir. Shadow, whose son art thou? My mother's son, sir. Thy mother's son, like enough, and thy father's shadow. <laughs> so the son of the female is the shadow of the male. It is often so indeed, but much of the father's substance. Do you like him, Sir John? Uh, shadow will serve for summer. Prick him, for we have a number of shadows to fill up the muster book. Thomas Watt. Where's he? Here, sir. Is thy name Watt? Yes, sir. Thou art a very ragged wart. Shall I pick him down, Sir John? It were superfluous, for his apparel is built upon his back, and the whole frame stands upon pins. <laughs> prick him no more. <laughs> you can do it, sir. You can do it. I commend you well. Francis Feeble. Here, sir. What trade art thou, Feeble? A woman's tailor, sir. Shall I pick him, sir? You may, but if he'd been a man's tailor, he'd have pricked you. <laughs> <laughs> Wilt thou make as many holes in an enemy's battle as thou hast done in a woman's petticoat? Uh, I will do my good will, sir. You can have no more. Oh, well said, good woman's tailor. Well said, courageous feeble. Thou wilt be as valiant as the wrathful dove, or most magnanimous mouse. Prick the woman's tailor well, Master Shallow. Deep, Master Shallow. <laughs> I would wart might have gone, sir. I would thou art a man's tailor, that thou mightst mend him and make him fit to go. I cannot put him to a private soldier that is the leader of so many thousands. Let that suffice, most forcible, feeble. It shall suffice, sir. I'm bound to the reverend feeble. Who's next? Peter Bullcalf for the Green. Yeah, Mary, let's see Bullcalf. Yes, yeah, sir. Oh, 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 God, a likely fellow. Come, prick Bullcalf till he roar again. Ah, oh, Lord, good my captain. What? Dost thou roar before thou art pricked? Ah, oh, Lord, sir, I am a diseased man. What disease hast thou? A horse and cow, sir. <laughs> Cough, sir. Which are caught with ringing in the king's affairs upon his coronation day, sir. Come, thou shalt go to the wars in a gown. <laughs> we will have away thy cold, and I will take such order that thy friends shall ring for thee. Is here all? Here is two more call than your number. You must have but four here, sir, and so I pray you, go in with me to dinner. Come, I will go drink with you, but I cannot tarry dinner. I am glad to see you by my troth, Master Shallow. Oh, Sir John, do you remember since we lay all night in the windmill in St. George's Field. Yeah, no more of that, no good master Shallow, no more of that. <laughs> oh, it was a merry night. Uh, and uh, is Jane Nightwork alive? She lives, Master Shallow. She never could away with me. Never, never. <laughs> she would always say she could not abide, Master Shallow. By the mass, I could anger her to the heart. She was then a bona roba. Does she... Uh, Hold her own, well? 
old, old Master oh, Shadow. Nay, she must be old. She cannot choose but be old. For oh, certain she's old. I've had Robin Nightwork by old Nightwork before I came to Clement's Inn. Hey, that's fifty-five years ago. <laughs> oh, cousin Silence, but thou had seen that that this knight and I have seen. <laughs> hey, Sir John, said I well. We have heard the chimes at midnight, Master Shadow. That we have, that we have, that we have in face, Sir John. Our watchword was him, boys. <laughs> come, let's dinner. Come, let's to dinner. Jesus, the days that we have seen. Come, <laughs> come. Good Master Corporate Bardo. Yeah. Stand, my friend. And he's four harry tin shillings in French crowns for you. Mm. Very true, sir. I'd as least be hanged, sir, as God. And yet, for my own part, sir, I do not care. Yeah. But rather, because I am unwilling, and for my own part, I have a desire to stay with my friends. Else, sir, I did not care, for my own part, so much. Go to. Stand aside. Mm. Uh, and good master, corporal captain, for my old dame's sake, stand, my friend. Oh. She has nobody to do anything about her when I am gone, and she is old and cannot help herself. You shall have forty, sir. Go to. Stand aside. <laughs> By my troth, I care not. A man can die but once. We owe God a death. I'll ne'er bear a base mind. And be my destiny, so. And be not, so. No man's too good to serve prince, and let it go which way it will. He that dies this year is quit for the next. Yeah, well said. <laughs> not a good fellow. <laughs> hey, I'll bear no base mind. Down, yeah. sir, which men shall I have? Four of which you please. <laughs> sir, a word with you. I have three pound to free Mouldy and Bulgar. Go to. Well. Uh, come, Sir John, which four will you have? Uh, do you choose for me? Oh. Maybe then. Mouldy, Bulcalf, Feeble, and Shadow. Mouldy and Bulcalf. For you, Mouldy, uh, stay at home till you're past service. Uh, uh, and for your part, Bulcalf. Uh, Grow till you come into it, I'll none of you. Sir John, Sir John, do not yourself wrong. They are your likeliest men, and I would have you served with the best. Will you tell me, Master Shallow, how to choose a man? <laughs> Care I for the limb, the fuse, the stature, bulk, and bigger semblance of a man? Give me the spirit, Master Shallow. Here's Wart. See what a ragged appearance it is. I shall charge you and discharge you with the motion of a pewterous hammer, come off and on swifter than he that gibbets on the brewer's bucket. And this same half-faced fellow, Shadow, give me this man. He presents no mark to the enemy. The foeman may, with as great aim, level at the edge of a penknife. And for a retreat, how swiftly will this feeble, the woman's tailor, run off? Oh, give me the spare man and spare me the great ones. Put me a caliber into Wart's hand, Bardolph. Ho, oh, Wart! Traverse! Thus! 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 Come, manage me a caliber. So, very well. Go to. Very good. Exceeding good. Oh, give me always a little lean old chopped ball shot. <laughs> well said, if faith, Wart. Thou a good scab. Hold, there's a tester for thee. He is not his craft's master. He doth not do it right. I remember at Mile End Green when I lay at Clement's Inn. I was then Sir Dagonet in Arthur's show. There was a little quiver fellow, and I would manage his piece thus, and I would about and about and come you in and come you in. Ratatata would I say, bounce would I say, and away again would I go and again would I come. Oh, I shall ne'er see such a fellow. These fellows will do well, Master Shallow. God keep you, Master Silence. I will not use many words with you. Fare you well, gentlemen, both. I thank you. I must a dozen mile tonight. Bardolph. Give the soldiers coats. Sir John, the Lord bless you. Yeah. God prosper your affairs. God send us peace. Yeah. At your return, visit our house. Let our old acquaintance be renewed. Peradventure, 
I will with thee to the court. For God, would you would, Master Shadow. Go to, I have spoken to her. God keep you. <laughs> Very well, gentle gentlemen. On, Bardolph. Lead the men away. <laughs> As I return, I will fetch off these justices. I do see the bottom of justice, Shallow. Lord, Lord, how subject we old men are to this vice of lying. This same starved justice hath done nothing but prate to me of the wildness of his youth and the feats he hath done about Turnbull Street, and every third word a lie, dearer paid to the hearer than the Turk's tribute. I do remember him at Clement's Inn like a man made after supper of a cheese pairing. When I was naked, he was for all the world like a forked radish with a head fantastically carved upon it with a knife. It was so forlorn that his dimensions to any thick sight were invincible. It was the very genius of famine, yet lecherous as a monkey. And the whores called him Mandrake. I came ever in the rearward of the fashion, and sung those tunes to the overscotched housewives that he heard the carmen whistle, and swear they were his fancies or his good nights. And now... Is this vice's dagger become a squire, and talks as familiarly of John and Gaunt as if he'd been sworn brother to him, and I'll be sworn he never saw him but once in the tilt-yard, and then he burst his head for crowding among the marshal's men. I saw it and told John and Gaunt he beat his own name. "'for you might have thrust him and all his apparel into an eel-skin. "'The case of a treble oat-boy was a mansion to him, a court. "'And now has he land and beefs. "'Well, I'll be acquainted with him if I return, "'and shall go hard, but I will make him a philosopher's two stones to me. If the young dace be a bait for the old pike, I see no reason in the law of nature, but I may snap at him. Let time shape, and there an end. <sighs> What is this forest called? It is Galtree Forest, and shall please your grace. Here stand, my lords, and send discoverers forth to know the numbers of our enemies. We have sent forth already. It is well done. My friends and brethren in these great affairs, I must acquaint you that I have received new dated letters from Northumberland. Their cold intent, tenor, and substance thus... Here doth he wish his person with such powers as might hold sortance with his quality, the which he could not levy. Whereupon he is retired to ripe his growing fortunes to Scotland, and concludes in hearty prayers that your attempts may overlive the hazard and fearful meeting of their opposite. Thus do the hopes we have in him touch ground and dash themselves to pieces. Now, what news? West of this forest, scarcely off a mile, in goodly form comes on the enemy, and by the ground they hide, I judge their number, upon or near the rate of thirty thousand. The just proportion that we gave them out. Let us sway on and face them in the field. But what well-appointed leader fronts us here? I think it is my lord of Westmoreland. Health and fair greeting from our general, the prince, Lord John and Duke of Lancaster. Say on, my lord of Westmoreland, in peace. What doth concern your coming? Then, my lord, unto your grace do I in chief address the substance of my speech. If that rebellion came like itself in base and abject routs, led on by bloody youth guarded with rags, and countenanced by boys and beggary, I say if damned commotion so appeared in his true native and most proper shape, you, reverend father, and these noble lords had not been here to dress the ugly form of base and bloody insurrection with your fair honours. You, Lord Archbishop, whose seer by a civil peace maintained, whose beard the silver hand of peace hath touched, 
whose learning and good letters peace hath tutored, whose white investments figure innocence, the dove and very blessed spirit of peace. Wherefore do you so ill translate yourself out of the speech of peace that bears such grace into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war, turning your books to graves, your ink to blood, your pens to lances, and your tongue divine to a loud trumpet and a point of war? Wherefore do I this? So the question stands. Briefly to this end, we are all diseased, and with our surfeiting and wanton hours have brought ourselves into a burning fever, and we must bleed for it. Of which disease our late King Richard, being infected, died. But, my most noble Lord of Westmoreland, I take not on me here as a physician, nor do I, as an enemy to peace, troop in the throngs of military men, but rather show a while like fearful war to diet rank mine sick of happiness and purge the obstructions which begin to stop our very veins of life. Hear me more plainly. I have in equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do, what wrongs we suffer, and find our griefs heavier than our offenses. We see which way the stream of time doth run, and are enforced from our most quiet there by the rough torrent of occasion, and have the summary of all our griefs when time shall serve to show in articles, which long ere this we offered to the king, and might by no suit gain our audience. When we are wronged and would unfold our griefs, we are denied access unto his person even by those men that most have done us wrong. The dangers of the days but newly gone, whose memory is written on the earth with yet appearing blood, and the examples of every minute's instance present now, hath put us in these ill-beseeming arms, not to break peace or any branch of it, but to establish here a peace indeed, concurring both in name and quality. Whenever yet was your appeal denied? Wherein have you been gored by the king? What peer hath been suborned to great on you that you should seal this lawless bloody book of forged rebellion with a seal divine and consecrate commotion's bitter edge? My brother, general of the commonwealth, to brother born and household cruelty, I make my quarrel in particular. There is no need of any such redress, or if there were, it not belongs to you. Why not to him in part? And to us all that feel the bruises of the days before, and suffer the condition of these times, to lay a heavy and unequal hand upon our honours. Oh, my good Lord Mowbray, construe the times to their necessities, and you shall say, indeed, it is the time and not the king that doth you injuries. Yet for your part it not appears to me, either from the king or in the present time, that you should have an inch of any ground to build a grief on. Were you not restored to all the Duke of Norfolk signories, your noble and right well-remembered fathers? What thing in honour had my father lost that need to be revived and breathed in me? The king that loved him, as the state stood then, was force perforce compelled to banish him. And then that Henry Bolingbroke and he, being mounted and both roused in their seats, their neighing coursers, daring of the spur, their armoured staves in charge, their beavers down, their eyes of fire sparkling through sights of steel, and the loud trumpet blowing them together, then, then when there was nothing could have stayed my father from the breast of Bolingbroke, oh, when the king did throw his warder down, his own life hung upon the staff he threw. Then threw he down himself and all their lives that by indictment and by dint of sword have since miscarried under Bolingbroke. You speak, Lord Mowbray, now you know not what. The Earl of Hereford was reputed then in England the most valiant gentleman. Who knows on whom fortune would then have smiled? But if your father had been lifted there, he'd ne'er have borne it out of Coventry. For all the country in a general voice cried hate upon him, and all their prayers and love were set on Hereford whom they doted on and blessed and graced indeed more than the king. But this is mere digression from my purpose. Here come I from our princely general to know your griefs, to tell you from his grace that he will give you audience, and wherein it shall appear that your demands are just, you shall enjoy them. Everything set off that might so much as think you enemies. But he hath forced us to compel this offer, and it proceeds from policy, not love. Mowbray, you owe ween to take it so. This offer comes from mercy. 
not from fear. For lo, within a ken our army lies. Upon my honor, all too confident to give admittance to a thought of fear. Our battle is more full of names than yours. Our men more perfect in the use of arms. Our armor all as strong. Our cause the best. Then reason will our heart should be as good. Say you not, then our offer is compelled. Well, by my will, we shall admit no parley. That argues but the shame of your offense. A rotten case abides no handling. Hath the Prince John a full commission, in very ample virtue of his father, to hear and absolutely to determine of what conditions we shall stand upon? That is intended in the general's name. I muse you make so slight a question. Then take, my lord of Westmoreland, this schedule. For this contains our general grievances. Each several article herein redressed, all members of our cause, both here and hence, that are insinued to this action, acquitted by a true substantial form and present execution of our wills, to us and to our purposes confined. We come within our awful banks again, and knit our powers to the arm of peace. This will I show the general. Please you, lords, in sight of both our battles we may meet, and either end in peace, which God so frame, or to the place of difference, call the swords which must decide it. My lord, we will do so. There is a thing within my bosom tells me that no conditions of our peace can stand. Fear you not that. If we can make our peace upon such large terms and so absolute as our conditions shall consist upon, our peace shall stand as firm as rocky mountains. Yea, but our valuation shall be such that every slight and false derived cause, yea, every idle, nice and wanton reason, shall to the king taste of this action, that where our royal faiths martyrs in love, we shall be winnowed with so rough a wind that even our corn shall seem as light as chaff, and good from bad find no partition. No, no, my lord, note this. The king is weary of dainty and such picking grievances, for he hath found to end one doubt by death revives two greater in the heirs of life. And therefore will he wipe his tables clean and keep no tell-tale to his memory that may repeat and history his loss to new remembrance. For full well he knows he cannot so precisely weed this land as his misdoubts present occasion. His foes are so enrooted with his friends that plucking to unfix an enemy, he doth unfasten so and shake a friend. So that this land, like an offensive wife that hath enraged him on to offer strokes, as he is striking, holds his infant up and hangs resolved correction in the arm that was upreared to execution. Besides, the king hath wasted all his rods on late offenders that he now doth lack the very instruments of chastisement, mm. so that his power, like to a fangless lion, may offer but not hold. Tis very true. And therefore, be assured, my good Lord Marshal, if we do now make our atonement well, our peace will, like a broken limb united, grow stronger for the breaking. Be it so. Here is returned, my Lord of Westmoreland. The Prince is here at hand, pleaseth your Lordship to meet his grace, just distance between our armies. Your Grace of York, in God's name, then, set forward. Before and greet his grace, my Lord. We come. You are well encountered here, my cousin Mowbray. Good day to you, gentle Lord Archbishop, and so to you, Lord Hastings, and to all. My lord of York, it better showed with you when that your flock, assembled by the bell, encircled you to hear with reverence your exposition on the holy text, than now to see you hear an iron man cheering a rout of rebels with your drum, turning the word to sword and life to death. That man that sits within a monarch's heart and ripens in the sunshine of his favor, would he abuse the countenance of the king? Alack, what mischiefs might he set a brooch in shadow of such greatness? With you, Lord Bishop, it is even so. Who hath not heard it spoken how deep you were within the books of God? To us, the speaker in his parliament, to us, the imagined voice of God himself, the very opener and intelligencer between the grace 
the sanctities of heaven and our dull workings. Oh, who shall believe but you misuse the reverence of your place? Employ the countenance and grace of heaven as a false favourite doth his prince's name in deeds dishonourable. You have ta'en up under the counterfeited zeal of God the subjects of his substitute, my father, and both against the peace of heaven and him have here upswarmed them. Good my lord of Lancaster, I am not here against your father's peace, but as I told my lord of Westmoreland, the time misordered doth in common sense crowd us and crush us to this monstrous form to hold our safety up. I sent your grace the parcels and particulars of our grief, the which hath been with scorn shoved from the court, whereon this Hydra, son of war, is born, whose dangerous eyes may well be charmed asleep with grant of our most just and right desires, and true obedience of this madness cured, stoop tamely to the foot of majesty. If not, we ready are to try our fortunes to the last man. And though we here fall down, we have supplies to second our attempt. If they miscarried, theirs shall second them, and so success of mischief shall be born, and heir from heir shall hold this quarrel up, whilst England shall have generation. You are too shallow, Hastings, much too shallow to sound the bottom of the aftertimes. Pleaseth your grace to answer them directly how far forth you do like their articles. I like them all, and do allow them well, and swear here, by the honour of my blood, my father's purposes have been mistook, and some about him have too lavishly wrested his meaning and authority. My lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed. Upon my soul they shall. If this may please you, discharge your powers unto their several counties, as we will ours. And here, between the armies, let's drink together friendly and embrace that all their eyes may bear those tokens home of our restored love and amity. I take your princely word for these redresses. I give it you, and will maintain my word, and thereupon I drink unto your grace. Go, Captain, and deliver to the army this news of peace. Let them have pay and part, and I know it will well please them. Hide thee, Captain. To you, my noble lord of Westmoreland. I pledge your grace. And if you knew what pains I have bestowed to breed this present peace, you would drink freely. But my love to ye shall show itself more openly hereafter. I do not doubt you. I am glad of it. Health to my lord and gentle cousin Mowbray. You wish me health in very happy season, for I am on the sudden something ill. Against ill chances men are ever merry, but heaviness foreruns the good event. Therefore be merry, cause, since sudden sorrow serves to say thus, some good thing comes tomorrow. Believe me, I am passing light in spirit. So much the worse, if your own rule be true. The word of peace is rendered. Hark how they shout. This had been cheerful after victory. A peace is of the nature of a conquest, for then both parties nobly are subdued, and neither party loser. Go, my lord. And let our army be discharged too. And, good my lord, so please you, let our trains march by us, that we may peruse the men we should have coped with all. Go, good Lord Hastings, and ere they be dismissed, let them march by. I trust, lords, we shall lie tonight together. Now, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? The leaders having charge from you to stand will not go off until they hear you speak. <laughs> They know their duties. My lord, our army is dispersed already. Like youthful steers unyoked, they take their courses east, west, north, south, or like a school bro broke up, each hurries toward his home and sporting place. Good tidings, my lord Hastings. For the which I do arrest thee, traitor of high treason. And you, Lord Archbishop, and you, Lord Mowbray, of capital treason, I attach you both. Is this proceeding just and honourable? Is your assembly so? Will you thus break your faith? I pawned thee none. I promised you redress of these same grievances whereof you did complain, which by mine honour I will perform the most Christian care. But for you, rebels, look to taste the dew, meet for rebellion, and such acts as yours. Most shallowly did you these arms commence, 
fondly brought here and foolishly sent hence. Strike up our drums, pursue the scattered stray. God, and not we, hath safely fought today. Some guard these traitors to the block of death. Treason's true bed, and yielder up of breath. Ha, ha, ha. What's your name, sir? Of what condition are you, and of what place, I pray? I am a knight, sir, and my name is Colville of the Dale. Well, then, Colville is your name, a knight is your degree, and your place the Dale. Colville shall be still your name, a traitor your degree, and the dungeon your place, a place deep enough. So shall you be still, Colville of the Dale. Are not you, Sir John Falstaff? As good a man as he, sir, whoever I am. Do you yield, sir, or shall I sweat for you? If I do sweat, they are the drops of thy lovers, and they weep for thy death. Therefore, rouse up fear and trembling, and do observance to my mercy. I think you are, Sir John Falstaff. In that thought, yield me. <laughs> I have a whole school of tongues in this belly of mine, and not a tongue of them all speaks any other word but my name. And I had but a belly of any indifference. I was simply the most active fellow in Europe. My womb, my womb, my womb undoes me. Here comes our general. Heat is past, follow no further now. Call in the powers, good cousin Westmoreland. Now, Falstaff, where have you been all this while? When everything is ended, then you come. These tardy tricks of yours will, on my life, one time or other, break some gallows back. I would be sorry, my lord, but it should be thus. I never knew yet, but a rebuke and check was the reward of valour. Do you think me a swallow, an arrow, or a bullet? Have I, in my poor and old motion, the expedition of thought? I have speeded hither with the very extremest inch of possibility. I have founded nine score and odd posts, and here, travel tainted as I am, have in my pure and immaculate valour taken Sir John Colville of the Dale, a most furious knight and valorous enemy. <coughs> but what of that? He saw me and yielded, that I may justly say with the hook-nosed fellow of Rome, their Caesar, I came, saw, and overcame. It was more of his courtesy than your deserving. I know not. Here he is, and here I yield him. And I beseech your grace, let it be booked with the rest of this day's deeds, or by the Lord I will have it in a particular ballad else, with my own picture on the top on Colville kissing my foot. To the which course, if I be enforced, if you do not all show like guilt tuppences to me, and I, in the clear sky of fame, o'ershine you as much as the full moon doth the cinders of the element, which show like pins' heads to her, believe not the word of the noble. Therefore let me have right, and let desert mount. Thine's too heavy to mount. Let it shine, then. Thine's too thick to shine. Let it do something, my good lord, that may do me good, and call it what you will. Is thy name Colville? It is, my lord. A famous rebel art thou, Colville. And a famous true subject took him. I am, my lord, but as my betters are that led me hither. Had they been ruled by me, you should have won them dearer than you have. I know not how they sold themselves, but thou, like a kind fellow, gavest thyself away gratis, and I thank thee for thee. Now have you left pursuit. Retreat is made, and execution stayed. Send Colville with his confederates to York to present execution. Blunt, lead him hence, and see you guard him sure. And now dispatch we toward the court, my lords. I hear the king, my father, is sore sick. And you shall go before us to his majesty, which cousin you shall bear to comfort him. And we, with sober speed, will follow you. My lord, I beseech you, give me leave to go through Gloucestershire. And when you come to court, stand my good lord, pray, in your good report. Fare you well, Falstaff. 
I, in my condition, shall better speak of you than you deserve. Would you had but the wit to a better than your dukedom? Good faith. This same young, sober-blooded boy doth not love me, nor a man cannot make him laugh, but that's no marvel. He drinks no wine. There's never none of these demure boys come to any proof, for thin drink doth so overcool their blood, and making many fish meals, that they fall into a kind of male green sickness, and then when they marry, they get a wenches. They are generally fools and cowards, which some of us should be too, but for inflammation. A good sheriff's sack hath a twofold operation in it. It sends me into the brain, dries me there all the foolish and dull and crudy vapours which environ it, makes it apprehensive, quick, forgetive, full of nimble, fiery, and delectable shapes, which, delivered o'er to the voice, the tongue which is the birth, becomes excellent wit. The second property of your excellent sheriffs is the warming of the blood, which, before cold and settled, left the liver white and pale, which is the badge of pusillanimity and cowardice. But the sheriffs warms it and makes it coarse from the inwards to the parts extremes. It illumineth the face, which, as a beacon, gives warning to all the rest of this little kingdom, man to arm. And then the vital commoners and inland petty spirits muster me all to their captain, the heart, who, great and puffed up with this retinue, doth any deed of courage. And this valour comes of Sheris. So that skill in the weapon is nothing without sack, for that sets it a work, and learning a mere hoard of gold kept by a devil, till sack commences it and sets it in act and use. Hereof comes it that Prince Harry is valiant, for the cold blood he did naturally inherit of his father. He hath, like lean, sterile, and bare land, manured, husbanded, and tilled with excellent endeavour of drinking good and good store of fertile sheriffs, that he is become very hot and valiant. If I had a thousand sons, the first humane principle I would teach them should be to forswear thin potations and to addict themselves to sack. How now, Bardolph? The army is discharged all and gone. Let them go. <laughs> I'll through Gloucestershire, and there will I visit Master Robert Fallow, ah. Esquire. I have him already tempering between my finger and my thumb, and shortly will I seal with him. <laughs> Come away. <laughs> If God doth give successful end to this debate that bleedeth at our doors, we will our youth lead on to higher fields and draw no swords but what are sanctified. Our navy is addressed, our power collected, our substitutes in absence well invested, and everything lies level to our wish. Only we want a little personal strength. And pause us till these rebels now afoot come underneath the yoke of government. Both which we doubt not, but your majesty shall soon enjoy. Humphrey, my son of Gloucester, where is the prince, your brother? Uh, I think he's gone to hunt, my lord, at, at Windsor. And how accompanied? I do not know, my lord. Is not his brother, Thomas of Clarence, with him? No, my good lord, he is in presence here. What would, my lord and father? Ooh, nothing but well to thee, Thomas of Clarence. How chance thou art not with the prince, thy brother? He loves thee, and thou dost neglect him, Thomas. Thou hast a better place in his affection than all thy brothers. Cherish it, my boy, and noble offices thou mayst effect of mediation after I am dead between his greatness and thy other brethren. 
Therefore omit him not, blunt not his love, nor lose the good advantage of his grace by seeming cold or careless of his will. For he is gracious, if he be observed. He hath a tear for pity, and a hand open as day for meeting charity. Yet notwithstanding being incensed, he's flint, as humorous as winter, and as sudden as flaws congealed in the spring of day. <laughs> His temper, therefore, must be well observed. Chide him for faults, and do it reverently, when you perceive his blood inclined to mirth, but being moody, give him time and scope, till that his passions, like a, a whale on ground, confound themselves with working. Learn this, Thomas, and thou shalt prove a shelter to thy friends, a hoop of gold to bind thy brothers in that the united vessel of their blood, mingled with venom of suggestion, as force perforce the age will pour it in, shall never leak, though it do work as strong as aconitum or rash gunpowder. I shall observe him with all care and love. Why art thou not at Windsor with him, Thomas? Uh, he is not there today. He dines in London. <sighs> and how accompanied canst thou tell that? with uh, poins and other his continual yeah, followers. Yeah, most subject is the fattest soil to weeds, and he, the noble image of my youth, is overspread with them. Therefore my grief stretches itself beyond the hour of death. The blood weeps from my heart when I do shape in forms imaginary the unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when I am sleeping with my ancestors. For when his headstrong riot hath no curb, when rage and hot blood are his counsellors, when means and lavish manners meet together, oh, with what wing shall his affections fly towards fronting peril and opposed decay? My gracious lord, you look beyond him quite. Mm. The prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue, wherein to gain the language tis needful that the most immodest word be looked upon and learned, which, once attained, your highness knows, comes to no further use but to be known and hated. So, like gross terms, the prince will in the perfectness of time cast off his followers, and their memory shall as a pattern or, or a measure live, by which his grace must meet the lives of others, turning past evils to advantages. It is seldom when the bee doth leave her comb in the dead carrion. Uh, Who's here? Westmoreland? Health to my sovereign, and new happiness added to that that I am to deliver. Prince John, your son, doth kiss your grace's hand. Uh, Mowbray, the bishop's scroop. Hastings and all are brought to the correction of your law. Oh. There is not now a rebel's sword unsheathed, but peace puts forth her olive everywhere. The manner how this action hath been born, here at more leisure may your highness read with every course in his particular. Oh, Westmoreland, thou art a summer bird which ever in the haunch of winter sings the lifting up of day. <laughs> Look, here's more news. From enemies, heaven keep your majesty. Uh, and when they stand against you, may they fall as those I am come to tell you of. The Earl Northumberland and the Lord Bardolph, with a great power of English and of Scots, are by the Shreve of Yorkshire overthrown. Uh, oh. The manner and true order of the fight, this packet, please it you, contains a uh, uh, and, and wherefore should these good news make me sick? Will fortune never come with both hands full, but write her fair words still in foulest letters? She either gives a stomach and no food, such are the poor in health, or else a feast and takes away the stomach, such are the rich that have abundance and enjoy it not. I, I should... Rejoice now at this happy news. Now my sight fails oh. and my brain is giddy. Oh, oh me, oh. come near me. Now I am much ill. Oh, oh. Comfort your majesty. Oh, my royal father. My sovereign lord, cheer up yourself. L look up. Be patient, princes. You do know these fits are with his highness very ordinary. Stand from him, give him air. He'll straight be well. No, no, he, he cannot long hold out these pangs. The incessant care and labour of his mind hath wrought the muir that should confine it in so thin that life looks through and will break out. The people fear me. 
For they do observe unfathered airs and loathly births of nature. The seasons change their manners as the year had found some months asleep and leaped them over. The river hath thrice flowed, no ebb between. And the old folk, time's doting chronicles, say it did so a little time before that our great-grandsire Edward sicked and died. Uh, Speak lower, princes, for the king recovers. Uh, Apoplexy will certain be his end. I pray you, take me up and bear me hence into some other chamber. Huh? Softly pray. <laughs> Let there be no noise made, my gentle friends, unless some dull and favourable hand will whisper music to my weary spirit. Call for the music in the other room. Set me the crown upon my pillow here. His eye is hollow and he changes much. Less noise, less noise. Who saw the Duke of Clarence? I am here, brother, full of heaviness. How now, rain within doors and none abroad? How doth the king? <laughs> Exceeding ill. Well, heard ye the good news yet? Tell it him. He altered much upon the hearing it. If he be sick with joy, he'll recover without physic. Not so much noise, my lords. Sweet prince, speak low. The king your father is disposed to sleep. Let us withdraw into the other room. Will please your grace to go along with us? No, I will sit and watch here by the king. <laughs> crown lie there upon his pillow, being so troublesome a bedfellow. Oh, polished perturbation, golden care, that keeps the ports of slumber open wide to many a watchful night. Sleep with it now. Yet not so sound and half so deeply sweet as he whose brow with homely big and bound snores out the watch of night. O oh, majesty, when thou dost pinch thy bearer, thou dost sit like a rich armour worn in heat of day, that scorched with safety. By his gates of breath there lies a downy feather which stirs not. Did he suspire that light and weightless down, perforce must move? Gracious Lord, my father. This sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden wriggle hath divorced so many English kings. Thy due from me. His tears and heavy sorrows of the blood, which nature, love, and filial tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously. My due from thee is this imperial crown, which, as immediate from thy place and blood, derives itself to me. Lo, where it sits, which God shall guard, and put the world's whole strength into one giant arm, it shall not force this lineal honour from me, this from thee, will I to mine leave, as tis left to me. Warwick! Gloucester! Oh, Clarence! 
Doth the king call? What would your majesty? How fares your grace? Why did you leave me here alone, my lords? We left the prince, my brother, here, my liege, who undertook to sit and watch by you. The, the prince of Wales? Where is he? Let me see him. He is not here. The door is open. He has gone this way. He came not through the chamber where we stayed. Where is the crown? Who took it from my pillow? When we withdrew, my liege, we left it here. The prince hath taken it hence. Oh. Go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep my death? Find him, my lord of Warwick. Chide him hither. This part of his conjoins with my disease and helps to end me. See, sons, what things you are. How quickly nature falls into revolt when gold becomes her object. Well, for this, the foolish, over-careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts, their brains with care, their bones with industry. For this, they have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange, achieved gold. For this, they have been thoughtful to invest their sons with arts and martial exercises. When, like the bee, tolling from every flower the virtuous sweets, our thighs packed with wax, our mouths with honey, we bring it to the hive, and like the bees, are murdered for our pains. Oh. This bitter taste yields his engrossments to the ending father. Now, where is he that will not stay so long till his friend's sickness hath determined me? My lord, I found the prince in the next room, washing with kindly tears his gentle cheeks, with such a deep demeanour in great sorrow, the tyranny which never quaffed but blood would, by beholding him, have washed his knife with gentle eye drops. He is coming hither. But wherefore did he take away the crown? Lo, where he comes. Come hither to me, Harry. Depart the chamber. Leave us here alone. My liege. I never thought to hear you speak again. Thy wish was father, Harry, to that thought. I stay too long by thee, I weary thee. Dost thou so hunger for mine empty chair, that thou wilt needs invest thee with mine honours before thy hour be ripe? Oh, foolish youth, thou seek'st the greatness that will overwhelm thee. Stay but a little, for my cloud of dignity is held from falling with so weak a wind that it will quickly drop. My day is dim. Thou hast stolen that which after some few hours were thine without offence, and at my death thou hast sealed up my expectation. Thy life did manifest thou lovest me not, and thou wilt have me die assured of it. Thou hidst a thousand daggers in thy thoughts which thou hast whetted on thy stony heart to stab at half an hour of my life. What, canst thou not forbear me half an hour? Then get thee gone, and dig my grave thyself, and bid the merry bells ring to thine ear, that thou art crowned, not that I am dead. Let all the tears that should bedew my hearse be drops of balm to sanctify thy head. Only compound me with forgotten dust. Give that which gave thee life unto the worms. Pluck down my officers, break my decrees, for now a time is come to mock at form. Harry the fifth is crowned. Up, vanity! Down, royal state! All you sage counsellors, hence! And to the English court assemble now from every region, apes of idleness! Now, neighbour confines, purge you of your scum! Have you a ruffian that will swear, drink, dance, revel the night, rob, murder, and commit the oldest sins, the newest kind of ways? Be happy, he will trouble you no more. England shall double-gild his treble guilt. England shall give him office, honour, might, for the fifth Harry from curbed licence plucks the muzzle of restraint, and the wild dog shall 
shall flesh his tooth on every innocent. Oh, my poor kingdom, sick with civil blows. When that my care could not withhold thy riots, what wilt thou do when riot is thy care? Oh, thou wilt be a wilderness again, peopled with wolves, thy old inhabitants. Oh, pardon me, my liege, but for my tears, the moist impediments unto my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke, ere you with grief had spoke, and I had heard the course of it so far. There is your crown. And he that wears the crown immortally, long guarded yours. If I affect it more, then as your honour and as your renown, let me no more from this obedience rise, which my most inward true and duteous spirit teacheth this prostrate and exterior bending. God witness with me. When I here came in, and found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. If I do feign, oh, let me in my present wildness die, and never live to show the incredulous world the noble change that I have purposed, coming to look on you, thinking you dead. <laughs> and dead almost, my liege, to think you were. I speak unto this crown as having sense, and thus upbraided it, the care on thee depending hath fed upon the body of my father. Therefore thou best of gold art worst of gold. Other less fine in carrot is more precious, preserving life and medicine potable. But thou, most fine, most honoured, most renowned, hast et thy bearer up. Thus, my most royal liege, Accusing it, I put it on my head, To try with it as with an enemy That had before my face murdered my father, The quarrel of a true inheritor. But if it did infect my blood with joy, Or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, If any rebel or vain spirit of mine Did with the least affection of a welcome Give entertainment to the might of it, let God for ever keep it from my head, and make me as the poorest vassal is that doth with awe and terror kneel to it. O oh, my son, God put it in thy mind to take it hence, that thou mightst win the more thy father's love pleading so wisely in excuse of it. Come hither, Harry. Sit thou by my bed. And here I think the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe. God knows, my son, by what by paths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown, and I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head. To thee it shall descend with better quiet, better opinion, better confirmation. For all the soil of the achievement goes with me into the earth. It seemed in me, but as an honour snatched with boisterous hand, and I had many living to upbraid my gain of it by their assistances, which daily grew to quarrel and to bloodshed, wounding, supposed peace, all these bold fears, thou seest, with peril I have answered it. For all my reign hath been but as a scene, acting that argument. And now my death changes the mode for what in me was purchased, falls upon thee in a more fairer sort. So, thou the garland wearest successively. Yet, though thou standst more sure than I could do, thou art not firm enough, since griefs are green, 
and all my friends, which thou must make thy friends, have but their stings and teeth newly ta'en out, by whose fell working I was first advanced, and by whose power I well might lodge a fear to be again displaced, which to avoid I cut them off, and had a purpose now to lead out many to the Holy Land, lest rest and lying still might make them look too near unto my state. Therefore, my Harry, be it thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels that action, hence borne out, may waste the memory of the former days. More would I, but my lungs are wasted so that strength of speech is utterly denied me. How oh, I came by the crown, oh God, forgive me, and grant it may with thee in true peace live. Thy gracious liege, you won it, wore it, kept it, gave it me. Then plain and right must my possession be, Which I with more than with a common pain Gainst all the world will rightfully maintain. Look, look, here comes my John of Lancaster. Health, peace, and happiness to my royal father. Thou bringst me happiness and peace, son John, But health, alack, with youthful wings is flown From this bare withered trunk. Upon thy sight, my worldly business makes a period. Where is my Lord of Warwick? My Lord of Warwick. D doth any name particular belong unto the lodging where I first did swoon? Tis called Jerusalem, my noble lord. <laughs> <laughs> lord be to God, even there my life must end. It, it hath been prophesied to me many years. I should not die but in Jerusalem. <laughs> Which vainly, I suppose, the Holy Land. <laughs> <laughs> but bear me to that chamber, there I'll lie. In that Jerusalem <laughs> shall Harry die. <laughs> And pay, sir, you shall not await tonight. What, Davy, I say? You must excuse me, Master Robert Sallow. I will not excuse you. You shall not be excused. Excuses shall not be admitted. There is no excuse shall serve you, shall not be excused. Why, Davy? Yes, sir. Davy? 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 <coughs> Davy? Let me see. Let me see. Davy, let me see. Yes. Yeah. Mary. William Cook, bid him come hither. Sir John, mm. you shall not be excused. Uh, uh, Marry, sir, thus, uh, those precepts cannot be served. Uh, and again, sir, shall we sow the headland with wheat? With red wheat, baby. Uh, but for William Cook, are there no young pigeons? Yes, sir. Here is now the smith's note for shoeing and plough irons. Let it be cast and paid. Sir John, you yeah. shall not be excused. Ah. Now, now, sir... Uh, a new link to the book, it must needs be had. And, sir, do you mean to stop any of William's wages about the sack he lost the other day, I think, to be fair? I shall answer it. There's some pigeons, Davy. A couple of short-legged hens, a joint of mutton, and any pretty little tiny kickshaws. Tell William Cook. <laughs> Doth the man of war stay all night, sir? Uh, yea, Davy. I will use him well. 
A friend of the court is better than a penny in purse. <laughs> I use his men well, Davy, for they are arrant knaves and will backbite. No worse than they are backbitten, sir, <laughs> for they have marvellous foul linen. <laughs> Conceited, Davy. About thy business, Davy. I beseech you, sir, uh, to countenance William Visor of Wonkot against Clem Perks of the Hill. There is many complaints, Davy, against that Visor. That visor is an arrant knave, on my knowledge. I grant your worship that he is a knave, sir. But yet, God forbid, sir, but a knave should have some countenance at his friend's request. Yes. Uh, an honest man, sir, is able to speak for himself when a knave is not. Mm. I have served your worship truly, sir, this eight years, and oh, if yes, I cannot yes. once or twice in a call to bear out a knave against an honest man, I have but very little credit with your worship. No. The knave is mine, honest friend, sir. Therefore, I beseech you. Let him be countenance. Yeah. Go to, I say. He shall have no wrong. Look about, Davy. Oh. Where are you, Sir John? Uh, come, come, come uh, off with your boots. Oh. oh, give me your hand, Master Bardo. I am glad to see your worship. <laughs> I thank thee with all my heart, kind Master Bardo. And welcome, my tall fellow. <laughs> come. Sir John. I'll follow you, good master Robert Shallow. Bardo, look to our horses. <laughs> if I were sawed into quantities, I should make four dozen of such bearded hermit staves as Master Shallow. It is a wonderful thing to see the semblable coherence of his men's spirits and his. They, by observing him, do bear themselves like foolish justices. He, by conversing with them, is turned into a justice-like serving man. Their spirits are so married in conjunction with the participation of society that they flock together in consent like so many wild geese. If I had a suit to Master Shallow, I would humour his men with the imputation of being near their master. If to his men, I would curry with Master Shallow that no man could better command his servants. It is certain that either wise bearing or ignorant carriage is caught as men take diseases one of another. Therefore, let men take heed of their company. <laughs> I will devise matter enough out of this shallow to keep Prince Harry in continual laughter the wearing out of six fashions, which is four turns or two actions, and I shall laugh without intervallums. Oh, it is much that a lie with a slight oath and a jest with a sad brow will do with a fellow that never had the ache in his shoulders. <laughs> oh, you shall see him laugh till his face be like a wet cloak ill laid up. Sir John! Uh, I, I come, uh, Master uh, Shallow, I come, uh, uh, Master Shallow. How oh, now, my Lord Chief Justice, whither away? How doth the king? Exceeding well. His cares are now all ended. I hope not dead. He's walked the way of nature, and to our purposes he lives no more. I would his majesty had called me with him. The service that I truly did his life hath left me open to all injuries. Indeed, I think the young king loves you not. Oh, I know he doth not, and do arm myself to welcome the condition of the time, which cannot look more hideously upon me than I have drawn it in my fantasy. Hmm. Here come the heavy issue of dead Harry. Oh, but the living Harry had the temper of him the worst of these three gentlemen. How many nobles then should hold their places that must strike sail to spirits of vile sort? Oh, God, I fear all will be overturned. Good morrow, cousin Warwick. Good morrow. Good morrow, Good morrow cousin. cousin. We meet like men that had forgot to speak. We do remember, but our argument is all too heavy to admit much talk. Well, peace be with him that hath made us heavy. Peace be with us, lest we be heavier. Oh, good my lord, you have lost a friend indeed, and I dare swear you borrow not that face of seeming sorrow. It is sure your own. Though no man be assured what grace to find, if he stand in coldest expectation. I am the sorrier, would twere otherwise. Well, you must now speak Sir John Falstaff fair, which swims against your stream of quality. Sweet princes, what I did, I did in honour, led by the impartial conduct of my soul. And never shall you see that I will beg a ragged and forestalled remission. If truth and 
upright innocency fail me, I'll to the king, my master that is dead, and tell him who hath sent me after him. Here comes the prince. Good morrow, and God save your majesty. This new and gorgeous garment, majesty, sits not so easy on me as you think. Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. This is the English, not the Turkish court. Not Amorath and Amorath succeeds, but Harry, Harry. Yet be sad, good brothers, for by my faith it very well becomes you. Sorrow so royally in you appears that I will deeply put the fashion on and wear it in my heart. Why then be sad? But entertain no more of it, good brothers, than a joint burden laid upon us all. For me, by heaven, I bid you be assured. I'll be your father and your brother, too. Let me but bear your love. I'll bear your cares. Yet weep that Harry's dead, and so will I. But Harry lives, that shall convert those tears by number into hours of happiness. We hope no other from your majesty. You all look strangely on me, and you most. You are, I think, assured I love you not. I am assured, if I be measured rightly, your majesty hath no just cause to hate me. No. How might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me? What? rate, rebuke, and roughly sent to prison the immediate heir of England, was this easy? May this be washed in Lethe and forgotten. I then did use the person of your father. The image of his power lay then in me, and in the administration of his law, whilst I was busy for the commonwealth, your highness pleased to forget my place, the majesty and power of law and justice, the image of the king whom I presented, and struck me in my very seat of judgment. Whereon, as an offender to your father, I gave bold way to my authority and did commit you. If the deed were ill, be you contented wearing now the garland to have a son set your decrees at naught, to pluck down justice from your awful bench, to trip the course of law and blunt the sword that guards the peace and safety of your person, nay, more, to spurn at your most royal image and mock your workings in a second body. Question your royal thoughts. Make the case yours. Be now the father and propose a son. Hear your own dignity so much profaned. See your most dreadful laws so loosely slighted. Behold yourself so by a son disdained. And then imagine me taking your part and in your power soft silencing your son. After... This cold considerance sentence me, and, as you are a king, speak in your state what I have done that misbecame my place, my person, or my liege's sovereignty. You are right, Justice, and you weigh this well. Therefore still bear the balance and the sword. And I do wish your honours may increase till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey you as I did. <laughs> so shall I live to speak my father's words. Happy am I that have a man so bold that dares do justice on my proper son, and not less happy having such a son that would deliver up his greatness so into the hands of justice. You did commit me, for which I do commit into your hand the unstained sword that you have used to bear, with this remembrance that you use the same with the like bold, just and impartial spirit as you have done against me. There is my hand. You shall be as a father to my youth. My voice shall sound as you do prompt mine ear, and I will stoop and humble my intents to your well-practised wise directions. And princes all, believe me, I beseech you, my father is gone wild into his grave, for in his tomb lie my affections, and with his spirit sadly I survive to mock the expectation of the world, to frustrate prophecies, and to raise out rotten opinion who hath writ me down after my seeming. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now, now doth it turn and ebb back to the sea, 
where it shall mingle with the state of floods and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Now call we our High Court of Parliament, and let us choose such limbs of noble counsel that the great body of our state may go in equal rank with the best governed nation. That war, or peace, or both at once may be as things acquainted and familiar to us, in which you, Father, shall have foremost hand. Our coronation done, we will assight, as I before remembered all our state. And God consigning to my good intents, no prince nor peer shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life one day. <laughs> shall see my orchard, where in an arbor we will eat a last year's pippin of my own graffin, with a dish of caraways and so forth. Come, cousin, silence, and then to bed. For oh, God, you have here a goodly dwelling and a rich. Baron, 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 big as all, big as all, Sir John. <laughs> May good air. Mm. Uh, spread, Davy, spread, Davy. Uh, say it, Davy. This Davy serves you for good uses. He is your serving man and your husband. A good valet, a good valet, a very good valet, Sir John. Oh, by the fact, I have drunk too much sack, sir. <laughs> <laughs> good valet. Now, sit down. Now, sit down. Come, cousin. Oh, Sirach. Quoth how we shall do nothing but eat and make good cheer and praise God for the merry year when flesh is cheap and females dear and lusty laughs roam here and there so merrily and ever among so merrily. With a merry heart, good Master Silence, I'll give you a health for that and all. Uh, give Master Bard of some wine, baby. Oh, yeah. Sweet Sweet sir, sit. I'll be with you anon. <laughs> Most sweet sir, sit. Uh, Master Page, good Master Page, sit for a fight. <laughs> Let what you want to meet, we'll have him drink, but you must bear the heart's all. Uh, be merry, Master oh, Bardo, uh, and my little uh, soldier there. Be merry. Be merry, be merry, my wife. As <laughs> all for women, the truth grows <laughs> out and tall. Tis merry and all when bids <laughs> wag a welcome, a rich roll. Oh, time be merry, be merry. I didn't think Master Silence had been a man of this metal. Oh, I? Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho. I have been merry twice, and once there now. <laughs> uh, this is this your leather coats for you. Hey, oh, baby. Your worship? I'll, I'll be with you straight, sir. A cup of wine, sir? Uh, a cup of wine that's just confined, and drink unto the leman mine, and a merry heart lives long. Oh. Well said, Master Silence. And we shall be merry. Now comes in the sweet of the night. Health and long life to you, Master Silence. <laughs> Fill the cup and let it come. I'll pledge you a mile to the bottom. Honest Bardolf, welcome. If thou wantst anything and will not call, be sure thy heart. <laughs> welcome, my little tiny thief, and welcome indeed, too. I'll drink to Master Bardolf and to all the caballeros about the London. Ah. <laughs> I hope to see London. Once there, I'll die. I'll <laughs> uh, uh, I might see you there, David. By the best, you will crack a quart together, huh? Will you not, Master Bardo? <laughs> yes, sir! In the bottle pot! <laughs> my God, Sliggins, I thank you. The name will stick by me, I can assure you that. I will not out 
his true brave. I'll, I'll stick by him. Why, <laughs> there, Spoke King. Lack nothing. Many. <laughs> look, look who's at the door there. Oh, who knocks? <laughs> Why, now you've done me right. Oh, do me right and do <laughs> me right. Samingo, it's not so. It is so. It's so. Why then, say an old man can do some work. <laughs> Uh, and please, Your Worship, there's one pistol come from the court we news. From the court? Oh. Let him come in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now, pistol. Sir John, God save you. What wind blew you hither, pistol? Oh, <laughs> not the ill wind which blows no man to good. Sweet knight, thou art now... One of the greatest men in this realm. Oh, by a lady, I think it be. <laughs> but uh, Goodman Puff Barson. Puff! <laughs> Puff in thy teeth, most recreant coward base. Sir John, I am thy pistol and thy friend. And helter-skelter have I rode to thee, and tidings do I bring, and lucky joys and golden times, and happy news of price. Oh. <laughs> I pray thee now, deliver them like a man of this world. A future for the world and worldlings base, I speak of Africa oh. and golden joy. Oh, oh. base Assyrian knight, yes. what is thy news? Let King Cofetua know the truth thereof. <laughs> and Robin right. not, yeah. Scarlet and John. Yeah. <laughs> shall Dunghill curs confront the helicons? And shall good news be baffled? Then pistol lay thy head in fury's lap. Honest gentleman, I know not your breeding. Why, then lament, therefore. Uh, give me pardon, sir. If, sir, you come with news from the court, I take it there's but two ways. Either to utter them, or to conceal them. I am, sir, under the king in some authority. Mm -hmm. <coughs> under which king? Bessonian? <laughs> Speak or die! Under king Harry. Harry the fourth? Or fifth? Harry the fourth. Ah, future for thine office! <laughs> Sir John, thy tender lambkin now is king. Harry the fifth is the man. I speak the truth. When pistol lies, do this and fig me like the bragging Spaniard! What? Is the old king dead? As nail in door, oh, the things oh. I speak are just. Away, Bardolph, saddle my horse. <laughs> Master Robert Shallow, choose what office thou wilt in the land, tis thine. Oh. Pistol, I will double charge thee with dignity. Oh, oh <laughs> joyful day! I would not take a knighthood for my forte. <laughs> I do bring good news. <laughs> Carry Master Silence to bed. <laughs> Master Shallow, what? My lord Shallow, oh, <laughs> be what thou wilt. I am Fortune's steward. Get on thy boots. We'll ride all night. Oh, sweet pistol. Away, bud. Come, pistol. Come all to me, and with all devise something to do thyself good. Boots, boots, Master Shallow. I know the young king is sick for me. Let us take any man's horses. Hey! The laws of England are at my commandment. <laughs> Blessed are they that have been my friends, and woe to my Lord Chief Justice. Oh, oh, let vultures vile seize on his lungs also. Where is the life that lay thy led? Say they, hey, here it is. Welcome these pleasant days.
would to God that I might die, that I might have the end. And thou hast drawn my shoulder out of joint. The constables have delivered her over to me, and she shall have whipping cheer enough, I warrant her. There hath been a man or two lately killed about her. Not talk, not talk, you lie! Come on, I'll tell thee what thou damn tripe busy rascal, and the times I now go with do miscarry, thou art better than I'd struck thy mother, thou paper vice villain! Oh, the Lord, that Sir John would come. He would make this a bloody day to somebody. <laughs> but I pray God the fruit of her womb miscarry. If it do, you shall have a dozen of cushions again. You have but eleven now. Come, I charge you both. Go with me. For the man is dead that you and Pistol beat amongst you. I'll tell you what, you thin man in a censer. I will have you as soundly swims for this, you blue bottle rogue. You filthy famished correctioner. If you be not swims, I'll forswear off, God. Come, come, you sea knight errant. Come. Oh, God, the right should thus overcome might. Well, of sufferance comes ease. Come, you rogue. Come, bring me to a justice. I come, you star. Blood out, good man, death, good man, bone. Thou utter me thou. Come, you thin <laughs> thing. Come, you rascal. Very well. <laughs> More rushes. The trumpets have sounded twice. It'll be two o'clock ere they come from the coronation. Dispatch! Dispatch! <laughs> better. This doth infer the zeal I had to see him. He does so. It shows my earnestness of affection. He does so. My devotion. He does, he does, he does. As it were, to ride day and night, and not to deliberate, not to remember, not to have patience to shift me. It is best, certain. But to stand stained with travel and sweating with desire to see him, thinking of nothing else, putting all affairs else in oblivion as if there were nothing else to be done but to see him. <laughs> Tis semper idem for obsque hoc nihil est. Tis all in every part. Tis uh, so indeed. My knight, I will inflame thy noble liver and make thee rage. Thy doll and Helen of thy noble thoughts is in base durance and contagious prison hailed thither by most mechanical and dirty hand. Rouse up revenge from ebon den with fell electo snake. The doll is in pistol, speaks not the truth. I will deliver her. Now, roar the sea. Ha-ha! And trumpet clatter sounds. My Lord Chief Justice, speak to that vain man. Have you your wits? Know you what tis you speak? Ha! My king! My Jove! I speak to thee, my heart! I know thee not, 
old man. Hold thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamed of such a kind of man, so surfeit swell, so old and so profane, but being awaked, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body hence, and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing, know the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. <laughs> Reply not to me with a full-born jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was. For God doth know, so shall the world perceive, that I have turned away my former self. So will I those that kept me company. When thou dost hear I am as I have been, approach me, and thou shalt be as thou wast, the tutor and the feeder of my riots. Till then I banish thee, on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by ten mile. For competence of life I will allow you that lack of means, and force you not to evils. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, we will, according to your strengths and qualities, give you advancement, be it your charge, my lord, to see performed the tenor of our word. Set on. Master Shallow, I owe you a thousand pounds. Yea, the matter, Sir John, of which I beseech you to let me have home with me. That can hardly be, Master Shallow. Do not you grieve at this. I shall be sent for in private to him. Look you, he must seem thus to the world. Fear not your advancements. I will be the man yet that shall make you great. <laughs> I cannot well perceive how. <laughs> Unless you should give me your doublet and stuff me out with straw. <laughs> I beseech you, good Sir John, let me have five hundred of my thousand. Hmm? Sir, I will be as good as my word. This that you heard was but a colour. A colour that I fear you will die in, Sir John. Fear no colours. Go with me to dinner. Come, Lieutenant Pistol, come, Bardov. I shall be sent for soon at night. Go, oh, carry Sir John Falstaff to the fleet. Take all his company oh. along with him. Oh. My lord! I cannot My now lord. speak. I will hear you soon. Oh. Take them away. Si fortuna me tormenta, spero contento. I like this fair proceeding of the king's. He hath intent his wonted followers shall all be very well provided for, but all are banished till their conversations appear more wise and modest to the world. And so they are. The king hath called his parliament, my lord. He hath. I will lay odds that ere this year expire, we bear our civil swords and native fire as far as France. I heard a bird so sing whose music to my thinking pleased the king. Come, will you hence? First my fear, then my curtsy, last my speech. My fear is your displeasure, my curtsy my duty, and my speech to beg your pardons. If you look for a good speech now, you undo me, for what I have to say is of mine own making, and what indeed I should say will, I doubt, prove mine own marring. But to the purpose, and so to the venture. Be it known to you, as it is very well, I was lately here in the end of a displeasing play, to pray your patience for it, and to promise you a better. 
I meant indeed to pay you with this, which, if like an ill venture it come unluckily home, I break, and you, my gentle creditors, lose. Here I promised you I would be, and here I commit my body to your mercies. Bait me some, and I will pay you some, and, as most debtors do, promise you infinitely. If my tongue cannot entreat you to acquit me, will you command me to use my legs? And yet that were but light payment, to dance out of your debt? But a good conscience will make any possible satisfaction, and so would I. All the gentlewomen here have forgiven me. If the gentlemen will not, then the gentlemen do not agree with the gentlewomen, which was never seen before in such an assembly. One word more, I beseech you. If you be not too much cloyed with fat meat, our humble author will continue the story, with Sir John in it, and make you merry with fair Catherine of France, where, for anything I know, Falstaff shall die of a sweat, unless already I be killed with your hard opinions, for Old Castle died a martyr, and this is not the man. My tongue is weary. When my legs are too, I will bid you good night, and so kneel down before you, but indeed to pray for the Queen. In Henry the Fourth, Part Two, by William Shakespeare, Julian Glover played the King, Jamie Glover, Prince Hal, Richard Griffiths, Sir John Falstaff, Elizabeth Spriggs, Mistress Quickly, and Brian Cox, Rumour. Northumberland was Peter Jeffrey, Westmoreland and the Porter, Philip Whitchurch, Mowbray, Mark Bonner, Hastings, Paul Goodwin, Lancaster and Peto, John McAndrew, Warwick, Stephen Thorne, Colville and the Epilogue, Alan Cox, Lady Northumberland, Susan Brown, Lady Percy, Jane Slavin, the Archbishop and Shadow, Michael N. Harbour, and Gower, Ian Hughes. Christian Rodska played Chief Justice and Silence, Geoffrey Bailden, Shallow, Edward de Souza, Pistol, Sidney Livingston, Bardolph, Charlie Simpson, Poins, Eve Matheson, Doll Tearsheet, David King, Mouldy and Lord Bardolph, Ben Porter, Gloucester and Travers, Alistair Simpson, Morton and Bullcalf, Chris Pavlo, Page and Groom, John Dalimore, Feeble, Justin Salinger, Fang and Clarence, Nicholas Murchie, Snare and Harcourt, and Peter England, Francis. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The musicians were Gina McCormack and Keith Pascoe on violin, Julia Knight, viola, Joyley Coos, cello, Kirsten Spratt, flute and piccolo, Steve Skinner, clarinet, Horace Cardew, bass clarinet, Sid Gould and Chris Storr, trumpet, Kim Burton, accordion, Dominique Legendre, guitar, and the percussion was played by Ensemble Bash. The music was composed and conducted by Dominique Legendre. Henry IV Part II was directed by Clive Brill. <laughs>